Oh, you know what I love? Sports. I love sports. Sports, 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 sports. When it comes to Texas A&M. Where are you getting this information? Let me tell you. Welcome to Texas. I need to talk a little sports with you, Ags. David Nunez here with Texas Radio. Billy Lucci here on Texas Radio. Olin Buchanan. We will develop men. We will graduate players. And we will win championships on the field. The best way for us to win is to do it together. Do you realize everybody knows who you are right now? I think we're coming into this year with a new confidence. Schools are like, we're freaking Texas A&M, man. Like... That's about as pretty a throw-catch combo as there is. I saw the safety roll, the slot fade. I knew where I needed to put the ball. You had <laughs> no other option but one hand at that yeah, point. Yeah, man. 50 ball, I got to come down with. You know, if I'm betting on anybody, it's the Aggies. And here we are, Texas Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio, The Go Hour, presented by The Warehouse at CC Creations. Valentine's Day, a special edition of the show brought to you by Academy Sports and Outdoors, your college football tailgate destination, an official sports good and outdoor retailer of the SEC. Stop by your local Academy store or academy.com and gear up for game day today. I'm David Nuno. Billy Lucci's here early in the morning, and head coach Mike Elko is in the house. Coach Elko, hello. How we doing? We're it's all nice right. to be over here in the Tech studio, you know, to get the invite to come over first thing in the morning. I appreciate you guys. Well, well thank Happy you for Valentine's coming in, man. Yeah. yeah, so let me cut that off right now and make sure I do this, right, to my wife back <laughs> in Durham. Happy Valentine's Day, hon. Appreciate you. Well, we're so happy to have you here. Um, I guess what, I wrote it down, 79 days ago, you take the job, right? So you knew it was going to be a lot of work, but did you know, like, the kind of grind? Obviously, college football's evolved over the last few years, but coming into this job, those 79 days of what it was going to look like. Yeah, I don't know. You obviously, listen, you take over a new job, and you know there's a lot to do, right? And you're building the infrastructure for a huge foundation in your program and all of that stuff you're aware of I, I i've said this to people though like i don't know that you can even begin to understand when with the portal with roster retention with what is truly going on today in college football what that initial 30 days looks like like i yeah no i don't think you could prepare for that at all what so when you took the duke job was just two years prior yeah how much has, has that process changed just in two in two years in college football? Yeah, I think the timing of it was so much different, and I think college football has evolved so much. Mm -hmm. So when I got hired at Duke, it was like three days before the dead period started in, in December. And so it was literally like I think I flew in on a Friday. I had Saturday and Sunday, and then it went dead. Mm -hmm. And so you got to spend a solid three weeks in the office doing what you had to do, plus – the portal hadn't really opened up. The portal didn't really become a huge thing until the, after spring ball that year. And so, you know, you didn't have the travel. You know, when I got here, it was right at the beginning of the recruiting period. Yeah. And so, you know, not only were you trying to go out and see the the 23 prospects, the, 20, or the 24 prospects, the 25 prospects, you're trying to see the kids in the portal. You're trying to see your own kids. Like it was, it literally was everything coming together all at once. Did... The fact that you had been here and knew some of, I, I don't know how, I guess a lot. I'm trying to think of how many of the guys, what percentage of the roster you knew, but because you had some familiarity, did that help at all in roster retention or was it still, was that the hardest part of this whole process? Yeah, I think it helped to some degree. You know, there's, there were a handful of guys that, that had played for me, right, mm -hmm. and knew who I was. Probably the vast majority I knew through recruiting only, right? And I had left before they got on the roster. Yeah. Um, I think the fact that there was a little bit of familiarity with who I was, there were at least people they could talk to to reference yeah. who I was, um, probably helped with a little bit of building trust in some of those initial relationships with the guys we were able to retain. Um, you, know, you look at a Connor Weekman, you know, I, I not to say that our relationship was great but certainly had a familiarity yeah. with him his family was around at recruiting dinners with him and so when you start talking to a guy like that about where we're going it's probably easier to get the conversation started it just seems like when you look around the country that's the most daunting task of a new coach and that's like the that kind of that danger zone when a new coach comes in is is retaining 
you know, such a – you guys did a great job in terms of keeping as much of the roster as you did. No, yeah, it's a huge danger zone because everything is relationship-based mm-hmm. nowadays, right? And, and um, especially – coming from, you know, when you come from a school in a different area of the country who maybe has a different recruiting footprint and you don't cross paths with a lot of these kids and you just walk in and it's mm-hmm. the, literally the first time you're, like that was us with the class we just signed, right? Yeah. Being at Duke the last two years, like I had never had a conversation with Tristan Jernigan ever, right? Yeah. And so you walk in here in December and he's looking at you like, I, for like yeah, like, you know, and, it, and that without having any prior relationship at all, you know, those things are always challenges. At what point did the A&M job seem like a place you could eventually end up? Was it maybe as a coordinator here, like, man, I sure would love to be the coach here one day. Was it maybe when the struggles were happening uh, or you were so focused on the Duke experience? Yeah, not so, not at all with the struggles, but obviously when you're here for four years, it's not hard to figure out how special a place this is. And so, um, you know, my family and I really enjoyed it here. You know, I think you guys know we turned down a lot of different – things to stay here as the defensive coordinator we were very happy here until the right time and the right situation came along for us and um, that was Duke and and still very thankful and appreciative for them giving me that opportunity but um, yeah this place is is special we as a family believe that I think everyone in this community believes that and um, so certainly when you get here and you see it and, and go all the way back to my first year hosting game day walking out on that field against Clemson like you know this is different this place is completely different than a lot of places across the country. Describe we a lot of us watch really closely what you were doing at Duke, both out of you know interest, but also just we liked you when you were here. You know, and <laughs> thanks, Billy. You're welcome. But in case you were wondering, but um, describe a Mike Elko coach football team. You know, I yeah. what when you trot that field out there, or the team out there on the field this year and beyond. What's the Mike Elko team going to stand for? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is is you know an appreciation for the opportunity we have to represent mm-hmm. Texas A and M, right? I think that's where to me there's a huge starting point, which is just to say, um, you know, we're in the one percent of the country and are who we are, right? I say mm-hmm. that to our kids all the time. Like if you look around at 19 year olds across America. Like you're living in the elite world, right? And so, yeah, what we do is hard. What we do is challenging. There's a lot of stress that comes along with being in the high level football player, but let's not forget like what we're really doing. I think that's a starting point, right? And then it's, you know, we want to be extremely tough mentally, physically. We want to be able to control the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. We want to be very disciplined. Uh, We want to be very prepared and and we want to walk off every field saying that's the team that played the hardest, right? And if you can put those things together with some talent, with some skill, with some really good scheme concepts, you can be a really good football team. How hard is it to not fall in love with just the talent, the stars behind a name, not that you guys look at that, but just the talent itself as opposed to the fit with the right amount of talent. Yeah, I I think this is, I appreciate you asking me this because Billy and I have talked about this a little bit off the air. Like what, what you have to do in recruiting is you have to identify future NFL talent. Right. And, and no matter how talented a kid in his high school, he's still not getting drafted right out of high school. Right? right. And so there's still something that has to happen. Right. And for some kids, there's a little bit more for some kids. There's a little bit less. But when you're talking there, there are a lot of intangibles that go into becoming an NFL draft pick. Right. And if you want to evaluate how we do in recruiting, I want you to evaluate it through the draft, right? And I know that's so hard in today's society, right? Because everyone wants to know Wait. right now, today, how we did in 2024 recruiting. But the reality is, is you really won't know. You won't know until two years, three years down the line when, you know, are these kids all SEC players? Are these kids getting drafted? Are these kids becoming? Because that's what the roster has to look like for us to win it all, right? And, and if the, we're going to win it all like we're capable of, we've got to have a roster out there that's got 17, 18 NFL players on it, right? That's what history has shown us. And that, to me, is what you're looking for. When he saw, he, you mentioned beating teams also with scheme. What was more difficult for you, hiring an OC or a DC? And the reason <laughs> I ask that is because I – the OC search, I know, I want to ask you about Colin Klein yeah. here in a second, but what was harder? Because I know with the defensive coordinator search, I, I know with you being a defensive coach, just how much probably, I can just picture you and the <laughs> amount of thought you put into it because you told me a while back, like, I want them to coach the defense on Saturdays. I'm the head coach. 
So was that the harder one for yeah. you, even though you were the defensive guy? Yeah, so, so, so obviously I think the offensive coordinator – position is probably the more important one from a higher standpoint because from a schematic standpoint obviously he's going to have to carry 85 90 percent of the load to yeah. my 10 to 15 percent um but the harder one for sure is the defensive coordinator because i think you know what i need is someone who's extremely intelligent who's an extremely hard worker who has a really good understanding of the game of football but also can kind of see it through the same lens as me right and and that's probably the biggest challenge is i don't know how well i would have partnered with somebody who looked at defense completely different than yeah. i did right because i don't know that I don't know that I'm at a point yet where I can completely just stand there and go, yeah, okay, I never would have done it this way. I but understand can. it can be successful, yeah. so you can, and I'm good. I don't know that I'm there yet. Yeah. And so I think it probably was hard just trying to find that partner. Um, I think we were very lucky in, in finding Jay Bateman, and so that will be great. So you go all the way back that many years, and you just remember – what it was like working with Jay Bateman and what he was about as a coach, or is that did you learn a lot more during the hiring process? Oh, I think well, not even the hiring process. I think the the when you point out the relationship, I think the relationship has continued for twenty yeah, years. Okay. You know, not that uh, I don't know that anybody can be best friends in coaching, right? Like you right. don't have the ability, the time, or anything mm -hmm. like that. But you know, when you work with somebody and you respect the person you work with and you stay in connection with them for a long period of time, you follow them, you watch mm -hmm. them in the off season, you know how they're, you know, and so that, that to me created a lot of familiarity with, mm -hmm. with Jay philosophically. I know who he is as a person. I know we've had a lot of football conversations over the years. Uh, I think that's what makes it easier. And you talked about how blown away you were by Coach Klein upon y'all's first face-to-face -face meeting and stuff. Since then, since you've been working with him now for, I guess, almost a couple months, what what's that been like? What are your impressions on him? Yeah, I just think he's extremely intelligent. I think he's a phenomenal human. I think, and when you put those two things together, like a lot of success happens. Mm -hmm. I think he'll be able to really connect with our kids. I think he already has. I think they can look at him as a leader mm -hmm. that they can follow. Um, and then I think he'll do a really good job of creating a, a structure and scheme that can kind of accentuate their strengths, right? And that's what kids are looking for. They want to know that when they go on the field, you know, the coach is putting in a lot of time and effort to put them into the absolute best position they can. When you're going around the state and you're talking to recruits, you're talking to coaches and high school programs, how is A&M being received? Not necessarily since you got there, but just overall how this as a program is, is looked upon. Yeah, I think everybody sees it the same way we do, right? Which is, is um, you know, there's a lot of excitement about what we can be and, and what everybody believes we're capable of and, and, you know, maybe a little bit of angst about why we're not there, right? Mm -hmm. and, and all you're trying to do is, is get in front of these young men and say, like, okay, hey, here's what it is, right? And everybody that we bring here, you know, the jaw hits their floor because this place is amazing, right? And, and then it's just trying to fill in the gap of, okay, here's, here's why we're going to become a consistent winner. Here's why we're going to be a team that's consistently in the playoff. And, and here's maybe some of the things that we're going to do to help you become the best player you can become and the, the best team that we can become. Um, I think that's maybe where, where everybody sees it. I think we're all in the same, if you look at it realistically, I think we're all in the same spot. You see what it should be, and, and now how do we get it there? When you guys got here and you're, you're attacking the portal, I, I felt like it was just – you know, a mile a minute. I was just trying to keep you busy. Exactly. Well, you did. Thank you. You kept. You took a month out of my off season, but it was it was for a good cause, I suppose. Kept Bronny super busy, which I really like. Uh, kept him out of the gym. But you putting that group together, and it's twenty plus guys. When when you guys set back as a staff afterwards, how pleased were you? And do you feel like there were any holes that you that you may need to go up back and address in the spring? Yeah, I think um, so. When we looked at it that week, so that you know we were able to get the couple kids early, and then you know we got the staff together, and that window was going to open back up in the early part of January when kids were going to be able to come on on campus. And when we looked at you know what that portal recruiting board looked like, and and what we needed, and what we were trying to add there was not a lot of margin for error, right? And, and that week, we were going to have to hit at a really, really high rate to get where we wanted to go. And so I think when you look at 
that when you just look at okay you know we got to go seven for eight with these dbs that we're bringing in like not seven for 14 but like seven for eight to get this where we want it to be um i think we were able to have an, an awful lot of success in, in what we were able to put together given the restrictions and the timing and all of those things um you know and then are there holes like i don't and i said this in that opening press conference when someone asked me this like i don't evaluate it as holes i just think you are constantly in the market to see where you can improve Get better right and and i don't think that you ever want a program that shies away from competition right and and so um you're going to make sure that you know you're going to find and look and continue to search for whatever you think makes this roster better moving into the fall and and maybe there will be maybe there won't be i don't know the spring portal window is always so mm -hmm. weird with who goes in and what's available and what you can get done but um if there's stuff out there for us we want to be involved in it is there a, a a wildest story during the portal season? Like, is there a guy here that you're like, I don't even know how he ended up here, or it came, or one that came together so quickly, like, um, you know, or completely off the radar guy? Is there yeah, one that me, stands let out? Me, let me think, like, uh, who would be the wildest? I mean, I mean, honestly, probably Des Ricks. Really? You know, I think mm -hmm. just, just at the end of it, you know, maybe more so because that one you felt like it was over mm -hmm. right like it was like okay we whew, all right we made it through this you know we're in a good spot we kind of got through it yeah and then all of a sudden it's it's like hey hey this might be going on and like wow okay yeah and then, and then like 24 hours later he's here and mm -hmm. he's like here here like going to classes here true and did he yeah, did he really yeah, come with his yeah it was like back. quick like really yeah. quick and it's like okay and uh yeah, so just probably that one yeah. from being like nowhere on the radar to on the radar to over mm -hmm. like that, you know, I think just speaks to the speed of what this thing is moving like sometimes. Go Coach Elka, we hear about resources in A&M having all these resources, and I think we think of the big things, stadium, the, the workout facility. But what does that mean? Like when you walk into there and you see – we have all these resources. Kind of explain to us what that means to you. Yeah, I, I mean, honestly, what it means is we have potential that we have to live up to. I, I think that's what it means to me. It's, it's. There's nothing I can't point to anything and say, you know, this is why we're failing. You know, we're not. You know, we're not failing because we don't have fan support. We're not failing because we don't have enough to provide our student athletes the absolute premium experience. We're not failing because we don't have the strength and conditioning program that we need, right? Like we have everything we need to build this program exactly how we want to build it, right? Which which is everything you want as a coach because that just means it's on us, right? Mm -hmm. We just have to do it the right way. Um, you know, we've gotta we've gotta convince people that our our quick present future is better than maybe the recent past in terms of playoff and success and where we want to end up and finish. Um, but I think people can easily look around and say, yeah, I can, I can see this vision. I can see where this is going. A really important thing going on right now, besides what y'all are doing in the off season, obviously is the athletic director search. I know you're not on a search committee. You're not going out. You're not the type of head coach that's going out hand picking but obviously very interested, probably more so than anyone. I guess the best thing I could ask you right now is what would you hope will be some of the characteristics? What would you be hope they're looking for in an AD? Yeah, and, and you know, I've been fortunate enough and, and have had some conversations with Mark Welsh, and, mm -hmm. and he obviously respects my opinion on, you know, what, what we need or, or what, yeah. from a football perspective, at the very least, we're looking for. And I just think you're looking for a guy that, that can come in here and understand – this modern era of college athletics and, and where it's going. I think uh, a lot like football has evolved, I think so too has every sport within the athletic department evolved, right? And, mm -hmm. and um, the role that NIL plays in everything, the role that um, running an extremely efficient athletic department plays, especially as we move into whatever this next era of college football is going to look like, which we all have an idea that in the next five years it's going to look a lot different somehow, some way. And um, just a guy who, who understands where this thing is headed and, and has a great vision and direction for where he wants Texas A&M athletics to go. All right, can we do one more segment? Yeah. we got to hit a break here. We'll come back with Coach Elko here on Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, and this special interview brought to you by Academy Sports and Outdoors.
Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio, Go Hour, presented by the Warehouse at CC Creations. This special interview brought to you by Academy Sports and Outdoors, David Nuno, Billy Lucci, and Mike Elko. I want to ask you a non-football question to start us off. Wow, okay. Was there a place you had to go to, to go eat, to go be a part of when you moved <laughs> back? Like, I miss this place. Was there a place? Yeah, you're going to get me in a lot of trouble in this Uh-oh. town as I go yeah, through this. Yeah, you got to pick one, right? So um, we had a lot of favorites when we were here, yeah. I think. Uh, uh, you got to give a shout out to 1860 because we sp- yeah. certainly spent a lot of time down there. And, and then to be honest with you, um, you know, we just we just liked the normal stuff. And so the first time my wife and I went out, we went to walk-ons. All right, we just went to walk-ons and sat in the back, and it's kind of where we belong. <laughs> I I did ask you, I, did I not? One day I said, "Are you do you go eat?" Because you know, it was in the middle of all the portal and the roster retention, hiring coaches. And he said, "Yeah, like." Of course. And I said, All right, boy, I didn't know if you were one of these head coaches that <laughs> just never puts himself in a public restaurant for four, five, six years. Because I've seen that happen more than once. The, the but, nice thing is I can just keep a low profile. I just kind of mind my own business. And, and um, No, we did. We always, uh, when we were here, you know, we just... You know, we just have always kind of integrated into the community and, and certainly don't want to do anything different. And the one thing I did always appreciate here was um, your people kind of leave you alone. They, they, you yeah. know, every once in a while you get someone come over. and But for the most part, people just kind of leave you alone and let you do your thing. And I always respected College Station for that. Almost a non – well, another, I guess, non-football one is how nice was it to be able to go home and see the family and how how's that whole dynamic going with – you know, that's common in coaching, yeah. obviously. No, but no, yeah. Really. I mean, obviously, it was great to get to go home. I think, I think for the whole staff, um, it just was basically, you know, hit the ground running. And, mm-hmm. and I don't think we even looked up until Wednesday. And yeah. it was nice for everybody to get out. I think a couple of the guys have, have now relocated their families here, which is good. Um, you know, we're still kind of in the midst of, of figuring everything out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think most people know I've got uh, an 11th grade son that's yeah. probably going to finish high school there. And so we're trying to situate that whole whole deal and uh, my ninth grade daughter. But, um, yeah, it's great to get back for a weekend and, and then, um, you know, Saw Michael during recruiting, uh, my son up in at Richmond, mm-hmm. um, happened to fly over Richmond, and so got the plane to swing in for dinner one night, which was good. Nice. So yeah, even two years out too, though I guess it is a little different because they probably both the high school kids have a ton of friends here too still. Which yeah, is not yeah. normal. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah, and, and it's funny they actually people don't think about this, but we spent more time here than we did in Durham, That's and true. so um, you know, my my daughter, you know, did third grade to seventh grade here Mm -hmm. and so you know a lot of her friend group that she met while she was here is still obviously here and so um yeah i think she's they're all the same right it's it's they've got the group that they've integrated into they've got this group back here and you know to try to be in both places if they could would probably be ideal well i guess before (coughs) we go back full football i do have to ask (laughs) i I, no, i one thing that you've done that the fans have really embraced and this was another thing that we talked about when you were at duke is the social media knowing you when you were at dc here and i guess because you know what well, we didn't get you in front of the mic but i i didn't know you'd have what's the shack meme i wasn't familiar with, with your game <laughs> when you got on, when you get on social media i mean you've you've really engaged the a&m fans via social um Talk about how, how much fun you're – it seems like you're enjoying that, especially especially when you start getting to commit two, three, four days in a row. Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, probably need to let everyone know that that actually is me mm-hmm. and not one of these coaches who hands his phone off. Right. Uh, I, don't, I don't claim to have immense swagger on Twitter, but I have enough for a 47-year-old right. head coach. Um, and then I do get some help. So I, my, my, my kids and, and my oldest one probably in particular help design some of the – ideas and yeah. thought processes that we put out there because they're obviously on it a lot more than mm-hmm. I am and so that it becomes this family deal and so we actually as we went through like okay what is our commitment GIF going to look like mm-hmm. how are we going to put this thing together you know we actually came up the family came up with some designs put them in a group chat and kind of selected that's the awesome. right one and, and obviously appreciate the fan base knowing it but yeah I, I think in this day and age um, 
so many people are on social media, right? And, and it's now no longer just a young people thing. It's literally an American thing for the most part. And, and so um, to have some type of interaction, engagement as much as you can, um, certainly without putting our commits and, and recruits at risk because mm -hmm. you still want them to have their moment and their opportunities as well. But, um, yeah, you like to have a little bit of fun with the fans when you can. Stoke the fire when the every, momentum every, is every once in a while, right? Every How, once in a while. Speaking of the <laughs> – engagement it's become such a part with nil with donors and and that i, I feel I'm, I'm sure that's going to be a, a significant part of your off season is making those relationships and and meeting those people what's your nil message to fans today yeah. we live in such a different world it's become so such an important part of this whole this whole thing yeah I, I think the the message is is it's here and it's here to stay mm -hmm. and and we can talk about what our own opinions are on it and none of that really matters because this is the world we're living in now. I think that's probably the starting point. I think the second part is to understand that um, a lot of what NIL goes towards for these young men is not these extravagant purchases, right? A lot of our kids are taking NIL and giving it back to families, giving it back to their homes, helping support people back at home and, and do some of those things. And so to understand that as well. Um, and then I think it's just understanding what value looks like. And, and that's what we talk to our kids about. That's what we talk to our program about. Like, there's a level of value that, that kids have earned in this day and age through NIL, and, and we have to provide that to them. Um, that doesn't mean uh, we have to get into massive bidding wars. It doesn't mean we have to do the above and beyond best. Um, but you want people no different than you want coaches yeah. in your building to feel like you value who they are and the role they're playing in your in your business right and, and mm -hmm. for us that's our football team um, and so I just think that's to me what NIL does uh, and if you can stay out in front and people in your program feel like they're being treated the right way a lot of times it won't be about the most it'll just be about doing it right have there been certain players that have become maybe a mouthpiece a leader that you oh, okay I did, you know that have kind of gravitated to your message and, and certainly held players accountable like I've seen the maturation of Bryce Anderson. Tori and York, you were very familiar with, obviously. Is anybody really stepping up that side? <laughs> it's funny. I was joking with him yesterday about this, and we were talking about this a little bit as a staff. I think um, we've got a lot of a lot of really good kids and, and certainly a lot of kids that are listening to the message and, and moving forward in the direction we want them to move in. I think to some degree some of them are just trying to keep their own head above water right yeah. now that I don't know yeah. that they're pulling other people along. But, but we got into really our first – workout yesterday where the coaches were out there and we were able to go out there and, and you know start to figure out how to push kids to their limits and, and kind of create new limits for them and, and it was good to see some of our kids dive in with teammates and, and help encourage push and, and drive kids to, to places maybe they don't think they can go um, it was a lot of fun it was a lot of fun to watch yeah. some of that how, how interesting I always I used to talk to Dan about that a lot just the ability of a head coach to understand the motivational buttons to push with in the NFL it's less yeah but 85 different players because yeah. that that is it's important because as soon as a guy especially today as soon as a guy feels lost in the shuffle or as soon as you or a position coach or coordinator can't connect to them they're probably on their phone checking their dms yeah. you know yeah, I think obviously it starts with relationships, right? Mm -hmm. And then I think it goes to genuine, real connection and genuine, real uh, honesty when you get in front of them. And, and, and I think I talk to people all the time about this, and this is the best way I can describe it. You know, this is the why generation, right? And, and they will take accountability. They will take discipline. They will work hard as long as they understand why. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe we were the because generation, right? Like so someone said it so. and you did it, and so we did it because we didn't know any better. Um, this group has too much information, too much knowledge, too much ability to figure out if you're full of it. And, mm -hmm. um, and so you've got to be able to get in front of them, and, and I think you've just got to be able to look them in the eye and say, like, hey, listen, like – what we're about to do is going to be hard. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, but here's why, and, and here's how it's going to help you, and, and here's where it's going to develop you in a way that's going to help you get where you want to go, not only in football but in life. And you know, let's give it a whirl and see what happens. And I think that's it's more that type of 
messaging nowadays. And, and it's funny you mentioned Dan because you even saw it a little bit from him that way in the hard knock stuff. Oh, yeah. You know, like they, yeah, like there was, I just remember him. Yeah, yeah and I remember him talking about like tackling and you know, this is why. Like I'm, it's not because, right? This is why. Yeah. And once you hit that why and it, okay, yeah. And then people will get behind you and they'll follow you. Yeah. What does year one success look like for Coach Elko? Oh, God, everyone always asks those questions. I, this is how I look at it, and, and this is honest to God, and this isn't coach speak. This is how we talk about it in our building. We want to become the absolute best version of this team that we can become, and I think everybody is aware that if we do that, there's going to be results that people will be happy about, right? And, and we're not lost on the fact that results matter, right, and our ability to create results matter. But I think if, if you put – tangible goals out there um you're you're looking and focusing on things that are too far down the road right we want to wake up today and go attack today to be the best thing we can be and if we do that enough consistently over time then you lift your head up and all of a sudden right when we got to duke and um you know we had come off of that, that team had come off of a three and nine season everyone wanted you know me to say oh hey we're going to be a bowl team or yeah. we're going to right and and i just don't know that that you can just push buttons and do right. that right? you just you roll up your sleeves and you work and and usually over the course of history that has proven to work and that's what we're going to do speaking of work what's the next spring ball not too far on the horizon what's the next month or so look like you mentioned you guys started the yeah, so we're call them team team off season work. <laughs> yeah, so we're doing um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The kids are lifting, and then Tuesday, Thursday, we do what we call competitive agilities, which which kind of brings in some some grit, some comp competition stuff, a little bit of football specific stuff, and, and kind of starts the process of us getting around the group and kind of starting to build the mentality that we want to look like and play with, and that'll lead right into spring break, and then they'll go into spring break, and then we we'll come out of spring break and roll into spring ball and, and get this thing rolling and play a little bit of football. It's your favorite time of year, right? Like the, the actual coaching, yeah. the teaching part of it? Yeah, and not that, um, listen, you have to embrace every piece of this job, right? Mm -hmm. But but at the end of the day, um, <laughs> we, we promised all of these kids something, right? And this is the time where we have to deliver on that, right? And, and that's to help them grow, to help them become men, to help them become great football players. And you can't do that unless you're actually in it with them, working with them, being around them. Um, and so, yeah, I think when you get those opportunities to be around your group, your team, um, you know, those are what you relish. It came yesterday, I think, Chris Del Conte at Texas said he was going to work. I feel like I know your answer to this. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just teeing it up here. He, he said he, he, they were going to work really hard to get that game move from Saturday after Thanksgiving to Thanksgiving night. Do you have a preference? Let's put a ball down. You put a ball down somewhere and we'll be there and we'll play. There you go. <laughs> That's <laughs> perfect answer. I didn't know if, if Thanksgiving, if he just said, don't interfere with my Thanksgiving, or if, you, you know. You put a ball down and I'll play anyone. <laughs> you put a ball down against them and we'll be there. Yeah, we'll exactly. Be there. Coach Elko, thank you so much for coming in. We really do appreciate your time. It was a great 35 minutes or so, and I uh, hope to do it again. Yeah, I appreciate you guys. Right, appreciate always. getting over here. Um, yeah, I mean, you know. I had your back, bro. Dalton said you came in and were, were saying you'd never been invited. I said, Dalton, quit trying to schedule interviews. I've been talking to him about it for weeks. Yeah. We're letting the guy, we're letting the guy build it. Well, I don't know. I came, team, over, I came over, staff. I took some pictures, and they were like, hey, you should come over. I said, hey, you should invite me. Right. <laughs> It's true. There's been no DC ever in here. Yeah. You, had to, you just had to become a head coach. I know. I had to get to a certain go, level. Yeah. Like, well, I'm, 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 I'm happy I'm there now. More than DC, though. That, I mean, it's pretty incredible. No, it's a lot of fun. It's awesome. It's a lot of fun. Looking forward to this, and uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun this journey. We are, too. Thanks for coming. Yeah, appreciate Mike Elko, everyone, and thank you to Academy Sports and Outdoors, your college football tailgate destination, official sports good and outdoor retailer of the SEC. Stop by your local Academy store or academy.com and gear up for game day today. We'll be back in two and two.
Hey, everybody. Tech Sags Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. We're here in the Rollo Insurance Studio. It is the Go Hour presented by the Warehouse at CC Creations. And how about that? The Mike Elko interview. Now we're going to do the post-game show on the Mike Elko interview. Uh, OB is with us here on the Go Hour. Sorry, the first 30 minutes you were you know, in the in the lobby hanging out with Ronnie. I, I was reminded about my, my uh, station at, the, at this company. <laughs> That's okay. Well, he was great. He was. He was awesome. And uh, a, lot to, a lot to unpack with him. We are going to talk basketball at some point this hour. Billy's going to be with us, I think, for an hour. We're going to move the OB part of the Go Hour from 8.30 to 9.30, and then Tom Schuberth will come in. We'll chit-chat with him before Bronny comes in to do a little uh, recruiting country. So my big takeaway, OB, is that you can ask that guy a question, and he's going to give you a genuine answer, and he's not going to give you coach speak. He's going to think about it, and there's certain things he's not going to be able to answer, mm-hmm. right? But he's going to give you a real genuine, thoughtful answer when he talks to you about it. And he do- I don't feel like he's judging you as you're asking questions. Uh, I've had head coaches, and I'm like, maybe I shouldn't ask that. But the- <laughs> by the way, they look at me. I think that uh, all that's true. I think he's a, a regular guy who happens to be a football coach. And a good football coach, by the way. Again, you can't have the success he had at Duke and not be a good football yeah. coach. So he's a very good football coach, but I think he's just a guy. Yeah. Um, the fact that he's saying, hey, you know what? We go out and eat at, uh, at walk-ons, and we just sit in the back, and we're fine. And um, – and I think that's one of the keys to success here is being willing to be visible in your community because it's a community that will support you. Yep. And, and what's wrong with a fan every now and then wanting to say hi and saying, hey, we wish you the best of luck? You know, I don't understand why any coach in any sport would be annoyed, would, by that, would yeah. av- be annoyed or avoid that. Yeah, it's – bottom line, though, good guy who I believe in and I think we'll see results. And when I asked him, what are your first-year expectations? I don't ever expect for him to, or a coach yeah. to say, oh, 11 wins. Uh, That's not how they perfect operate. Perfect answer. Right? But look, we're going to put in the work. And we know the kind of pressure that there is at an SEC school, especially a place like Texas A&M. We put in the work. We expect good results. Yeah. It's going to be the best team, that, the best version of what this team can be. And if you are that, again, I keep going back to the fact that They won seven games last year with a horrific offensive scheme, all kinds of coaching dysfunction, and you were still in a position to win against Alabama and Tennessee and Ole Miss in the fourth quarter, Uh, even LSU for that matter. Yep. And I'm thinking, you know, I know you lost some players, but you added some good ones. And I'm thinking – I don't want to be – I don't want to be overly optimistic because I've been burned too many times. Uh, uh, hello, basketball. To last yesterday. Yeah, well, there you go. But I, I'm cautiously optimistic that a better coach team, and you know, he just all the things he said. It's just like it, it's just to the point. To the point. Look, it's a results business. But when you like the guy, like really like the right. guy, it makes a difference, right? Yeah, and you gotta, at least in my role, always like the guy but i always want to stay just a sure, little yeah but i'll give you an example i mean it's a lame example it's an example his son my son graduated uh from college station high school the same night and i looked to my left and about right behind me like just three s- seats down was mike elko mm-hmm. and i my first thought was to go over there and say something no you know what let him enjoy let him enjoy but also of course he wasn't gonna didn't know he was going to be the coach at A&M at the right. time, but uh, he was coaching at Duke. But th- there needs to be a certain am- amount of buffer zone. You can be friendly without a doubt, but but what if Mike Elko uh, struggles? If I'm a buddy of his, I may be uh, no. compromising my ability to be critical. But, but I think for where we are today, if you like the guy, like you him. like the vibe, <laughs> Like it just makes it all like – it makes it easier to go to a press conference. It makes it easy to root for them. Um, I do understand when you like somebody, it's easy to hide some of the mistakes too, right. right? We have a job to do as journalists and as broadcasters to like call it the way we see it. But I like the guy. But I'll say this. I, I got a feeling. I got a feeling that we're going to like him even more because of the job he's going to do. Look, Aggies may not want to hear this, but the truth is, he has to do a lot, yes. 
but he doesn't have to do that much for us to love him, right? Like, like when I say that, like, I want national championships, right? Mm -hmm. But let's just start winning 10 games again. Start winning 10 games. It's been a minute. Let's start getting to 10 games, right? And we're going to absolutely love him. I think if um, if he puts out a team that is, is, like he said, the best version of what it can be, then he'll be wildly popular because, quite frankly, the the teams here have the ability to be really good. So year one of Elko, and I believe this year they could be they could I, be really I, good. They could be. And again, there is a lot of guessing going involved mm -hmm. uh, in, involved in this because. I don't know these transfer portal players, how it matches, how the coaches, how the message is received. There's a lot that goes into it. But is this team closer to the 9-1 and one team? Or are they closer to the 7-5 and five team? Or are they maybe closer to year one, uh, the Haynes King year one, the Colorado 8-4 and four year? Yeah, I think, uh, honestly, honestly, and I'm trying to say this in the most objective, no maroon glasses on, I think they're closer to the 9-1 and one team. Again, all the reasons I said just a minute ago. Yeah, they only won seven games last year, but they were on the verge of beating Alabama and Tennessee and Ole Miss, uh, maybe even LSU, Miami. You let that get away from you. You had legitimate, not not pie in the sky, but legitimate chances to win all those games. And you did it in a lot of cases with a backup quarterback, even the third string quarterback, and with dysfunctional coaching. So I'm going to start with Connor Wigman as my quarterback. And I believe he's going to be a star. I believe that about I Connor Wigman. And I see the guys he's brought in. I see the guys he's got back. Look, they got to get bet. They got to replace Adrian Cooper. That's not going to be easy. But I think they're going to be better in the offensive line. I think they're going to be better in the secondary. I, you know, that's something I didn't get into with him, but because I think the offensive line has always been the key. Even during the Jimbo dysfunction, if they blocked, yeah. they would have won, right? It, just, it, it sounds so simple, and I know it's more than just blocking their scheme. Scheme does matter. It does. The, the, and I heard him mention something yeah, about the scheme. He did. He did. I, in fact, I plotted it outside when did I you really? say that. Yes, yes. It but, like, it can be that simple, guys. Like, to, to, to be a really relevant football program on the cusp or maybe in the playoffs, if you block, this team is there. That's well, that, and you got to block and cover better. Both of those things yeah. you have to do better. And, and I think it's like Ronnie uses that uh, philosophy for baseball. Are they going to walk more people than they've ever walked before this year? No? Okay, so they'll be better by proxy at pitching. Now. But I'll, what I was going to say is they can't be worse than they were at the back end last year. Well, but but, but you got to look at both sides. Are they going to be as good a receiver without Anaya Smith? Probably not. Right, see. So, uh, but you have Moose coming in for my who so, barely played. So maybe, you know, that so so there are questions. There are no doubt there are questions that have to be answered. But I just think with stronger coaching, a better scheme, um uh, uh more emphasis on special teams, I think this A&M team could be you know, has a has a chance, a realistic chance, to be significantly better. But Missouri, you know, show me. Right. We can't take it for granted and say they're going to be but better. But what is significantly better? Well, Is nine wins significantly better? I would think nine wins would be significantly better. I mean, you had two, two wins to, a, to your total. But, you know, I, I've said it before, and I'll say it even for Mike Elko. I think the, uh, I think the expectation – at, at Texas A&M, every year should be 10 wins. I agree with you 100%. Let's hit a break. We'll come back. I don't know if – I think Billy's coming back at some point. He's probably talking to uh, Coach Elko in the lobby. Um, we should take the show outside. Yeah, probably talking about lunch. Yeah. I'd like to go to lunch with him. That'd be fun. Yeah. Well, we're not going to talk about lunch here. We're going to talk about Heritage Films right now. Uh, that is Chance McLean's company. They make documentary films. If you have not thought about it just yet, you like you just if this may be your first time listening to Texas Ads because Coach Elko's here, and you're like, uh, you know, what is this whole Heritage Films thing? You're probably not thinking that, but now you should be because I brought it up. Uh, it's a way to get a documentary done about your family. Uh, it's a way to get a documentary done about your dad, your uncle, somebody important in your family. Maybe your family business has got a cool story. Your family ranch has got a cool story. Uh, the way your mom and dad met, you want to tell that story. The way you started this awesome restaurant here in, in College Station or in Bryan, wherever it may be. 
That's what Harris Films does. They do documentary films for normal people, everyday people just like It's not just for the Brad Pitts of the world. You don't, why does he get a documentary? Why not Olin Buchanan, right? Call up Heritage Films. They'll take care of you. They'll also do another option, which is called the Year Flicks. These are smaller videos, right? So the Heritage Film, two hours, typically, close to two hours. The Year Flicks is more of a 20-minute Q&A video that's reserved for the youngers in the family, right? So sixth grader going to seventh grade, going into eighth grade, freshman year, you know the deal, right? You can do these 20-minute benchmark videos each year and kind of get to know where your kid is uh, in this fun, lighthearted way of asking questions. And I'm telling you, we did it with my daughter. You'll love it. The website is yourheritagefilm.com. Yourheritagefilm.com, This hour has not been overrated, OB. Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio Go Hour, presented by the warehouse at CC Creations. I did one of those OB moves right there, where mm-hmm. I said something kind of halfway clever, and I looked at you like waiting for the response. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I don't think we had to worry about much of an overrated chance mm-hmm. last night, did we? I still thought they were going to come away with the victory. I did, too. I did, too. When, when Boots got to the line and they take the lead, I'm like, all right, their defense will, will hold them here. And they played really good defense. I thought, at, fir- at first glance, I thought the kid from uh, Mangin, I thought he traveled. I did too. But and then when I went back and watched the replay, you know, uh, I guess it was Solomon blocked a shot from behind and it just so happened to go right back to him and he got – 
threw up a prayer and it was answered. Kind of reminded me of the NIT uh, uh, shot by Xavier, you know. Just well, threw up a prayer and it went in. So does that completely undo the Tennessee game? Completely, no. But look, I, I think the, I, I, it may put them back on the bubble. Yeah. All right, we'll get into that next on uh, Tex Ags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. All right, we're back here on Tex Ags Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. We are here in the Rollo Insurance Studio. Billy is with us. OB is with us as we continue this uh, go hour, if you will, uh, breaking down a little bit about Coach Elko. And we left the last segment finishing off with basketball, Billy. But since you're just joining us, do you want to start off with uh, Coach Elko thoughts or go back into basketball? Up to you. Well, Tell we, me. Well, we were just finishing with, uh, basketball. with basketball. Yeah, that I mean I, I didn't Devastated. listen to y'all, but that is the potential. I mean you know, you can't you can't 
chalk it up as it's 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 devastating because we just don't they could go beat Alabama mm-hmm. and Tennessee on the road and it's no longer devastating. It's just more of a like, God, why'd you lose that one? It certainly has the potential to be devastating. Well and, that and combined with Arkansas. It, yeah, like those two losses and and really, I mean, it's not as bad, but when you lose at home to LSU, that's that one will probably not be as bad for your resume. But you go back and you go, that's one you should have got. Mm-hmm. You get a, a team that's not elite in Reed Arena, and they and they beat you by 15. But that one, yeah, that one's not going to be a, a resume crusher. <laughs> this is going to be really, really bad, and it really has the potential to be like a quad four loss when it's all said and done. And, it, I mean, just if we're just being really honest, it completely washes out the Tennessee game in terms of your resume. Right. I mean, it really feels like it, it, it kind of washes it. And maybe I'm wrong on that. Maybe it doesn't work quite that simply, but it sure as hell feels like it does. And uh, no excuse. I mean, I know it's the SEC. I know it's a tough, very, very tricky place to play. I was worried about the game. I, I didn't think they would lose. I, wor- I, I noticed Vandy had played a couple teams tough. I was worried about the game, but I thought – this team playing the way they've been playing, coming off the Tennessee win, they'd go out there and and, and handle business in that one. It yep. didn't surprise me it was close. See, I was a little bit concerned because of the win over Tennessee. You thought that. And high. I even asked Buzz about it. Hey, you just beat Tennessee, you got Alabama on Saturday, you're on the road against a bad team. Do you believe in a trap game? He said, no, I don't I don't believe in trap games. Well, I think like you know, he may believe in them now. Because yeah, I think they like fell into a trap and right away it you know, from the outset, it just didn't look like this team had the same kind of focus um, or approach in the the games that they've been successful. Look, they they got. I'm telling you, I have not sat there and studied the stats yet from this game. I watched it, and they got they got whipped on the boards from a certain point in that game on. Maybe it was midway through the first set, but for a good chunk of that game, they got whipped on the boards. I know Vandy had some guys that got hot for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that the point guard, the, he, the guard played great. Imagine. The big man played. Yeah, the big guy. Played tremendous. Lupin, they couldn't, they had no answer for him. But they were more physical. They hustled more. Yeah. They had, they had better ball movement. A and M was slow in the rotations, getting around. So it was just the Aggies seemed to step slow. They mm-hmm. seemed to not be playing with that same sense of urgency that we've seen lately. Yep. And uh, and they got out rebounded. They got out. I think they got out efforted on they, the board. They got out Aggied. Well, the turnovers were the turnovers to me. A lot of them were very careless and to the point of. Watching it was frustrating because they were so careless, and it was in a lot of ways it was some of your veteran. It was your veteran players that were turning it over, and and then to still lose at the buzzer tells you it's kind of like Arkansas to get behind by twenty plus and go all the way to lose at the buzzer. Same thing last night to play as poorly and, and I think as uncharacteristic, you know, in terms of effort and intensity as they did, and still lose at the buzzer, tells you what the difference should be mm-hmm. between A&M and those two teams. And, and that's – they're 6-5 and five now. They ought to be 8-3 eight, you know, eight and three in the league and a contender to win it. And now they're 6-5, and five and you've gone right back, I think, right back onto – I don't want to say the bubble because there is no bubble yet. And I said this after they beat Tennessee. There was a lot they had to do. Still, and it damn sure didn't include losing to Vanderbilt. So now, I, mean, I, I know what the number, the, to me, before last night, I thought nine and nine with their resume and the wins over Tennessee and Kentucky and Iowa State could get them in. Now, losses like these make you kind of go, do they have to have a winning record in SEC play? And then when you look at the schedule left and you're saying, Get to ten with that. Yeah, it's hard. Yep. And and look, let, let's be honest. Um, committees haven't done a And M a whole lot of favors. No. And you just gave whatever committee 
in a, in a month a, lot of a, a reason to uh, dismiss you by going out and losing to, to Vanderbilt, a team that <coughs> lost nine of ten. And what, what sucks about it, honestly, is that was the last game they're going to play that was that landmine of a game. They've gotten the two at Missouri yeah. out of the way. Right. Got Arkansas though coming. You in do have town. Arkansas at home. Yeah, yeah. that's true. The, these landmine games. That's why when they went up to Mizzou and and got that win, it was like doesn't mean anything except a big sigh of relief, right? Well, by uh, if if you get that one more stop last night, you could have had a big sigh of relief. Well, I thought that was a bad play. I was like, they're take, wasting way too much time. Dribbling. It was a bad play. It was a tremendous shot by the guy. I I, I don't know. Did you know it got? I guess it got tipped. And, got blocked from behind by. I think it was by Solomon. And so that's why he was able to you know go up it, in the air and back down and and tremendous play by the guy. Yep. It should have never come to a final possession. I I didn't love taking Wade out defensively with what two seconds left. I think you got to have your best player out there. Um, but it doesn't matter. It shouldn't have come down to it. Back to mm. your point. It sh- this is the kind of game they should have won comfortably, and they didn't. And yeah. when you let a bad team feel like they're going to win at home, they oftentimes find ways to beat you at home. Yeah, college basketball is wild. And it is, it is literally like you get to these games, and, and it is gain nothing, lose everything. It's so hard to play at a peak level all the time. Yeah, mm. And you play that at – without a doubt, a peak level on Saturday. And then two days later, you're – or three days later, I guess, is you're on the road. And, and so it's a, it's a difficult – It was tough. It was trend, a tra- but, You said it. But if you're a, a mature team, you understand that. And, um, and I think they are. They should have been. Like, I think they're really, really going to regret. I don't think so. But I do – but I say that. I say I think they are. But you see the two, you know, Arkansas and Vandy. Yeah. But they're not a see. good road team. Let's see what they do. Because you know the the Missouri game up there, I guess probably I'd have to look. They at They played my better notes. against them there than they did at home. Yeah, but they were. It was a tie game or close to with about eight minutes to go, yeah. and then a And M you know pulled away mm-hmm. and dominated. So um, I thought they were going to pull away when Wade hit that three, and, mm-hmm. and, they, and they got up sixty nine sixty, and they didn't hit a field goal the rest of the game. Yeah. Yep. And it's the same thing that happened against Ole Miss. Yes. You go up five at the under four, and you don't hit a field goal the rest of the game. Is it because I mean, they rely on getting to the line so darn much? Because I mean, it, that's what it felt like. I don't like. think they were a parade of free throws, you know, necessarily. Like, I, I just think, look, when you're up in an SEC game with just under four minutes left and you don't score again, that's happened twice – in two games that you lost essentially at the buzzer, mm-hmm. I mean, nothing else. You can't tell me, well, they were, you know, not that you were saying this, but you can't tell me, <coughs> well, they got to the line a few times. Well, no, if you go the final four minutes essentially and don't score in two SEC games and lose at the buzzer, I can tell you all you had to do is make one shot the rest of the game. From 350 on, all you had to do is make one shot. To not make one and lose those two. Now that I think about it, I'm saying eight and three. This team ought to be nine and two. That the at the rate the Ole Miss game, the Arkansas game, and and Vandy. this one. Yep. And, it, and quite frankly, losing at LSU against at home against LSU when you had the lead at halftime. So that's the frustrating part, but it's also the part that goes okay. A team that is, you know, literally three possessions, one in each game, away from being. Nine and two in this league, that team has a chance to do something that we don't expect them to do. But I'm looking at this schedule, and I'm going, "What is that? I, I, it's going to be tough to go into Bama and win, mm-hmm. especially there, there's a rivalry there. Their fans are going to come out. A&M knocked them off number one mm-hmm. last year. They met in the SEC title game. I believe they won the last time they went to Bama. Th- this, there's going to be a, a lot of heat in that building, and and they're going to be they're going to have a hard time with that one." But you're looking at them, you go, can you go win at Tennessee? The ones that stand out to me that I go, you, you need to get something back, it, it's South Carolina at home, and it's at Ole Miss, a team that you, you really had beat in the first game. Uh, those are the two that I look at, and I almost look at this schedule and go, damn, those, those feel like 
get something back, kind of must win type deals. Because you have to beat Arkansas at home. I, I think you have to beat Mississippi State at home, and that's not easy. We, you know, Tolu that's Smith exactly. and that team, that's a good basketball team. And Georgia's a lot better, but you have to win that one and, on the road. On the road. And so to me, the two that are going to tell the tale are South Carolina yep. and Ole Miss, in my opinion. I agree. I agree. This team can still do it. Yeah. They just put themselves in a really, really – it's like they can't stand prosperity, and they they put themselves in a really they're, difficult they're spot. They're kind of as, as reliable as a roulette wheel. <laughs> you know, hey. when it hits, man, it's, it pays off in a big way, but a lot of times you're just kind of sweating it out too. For the sake of conversation, though, and don't kill me on this one, we talk about they could have won these games, mm-hmm. but that's what you could have said about A&M football the last two years, right? There's all yeah. these games that come down to a play or two different, and you are your record, guys. This is who yeah, they are. Yeah, but I, I think this team and these players have proven more than sure. recent A&M football. I'll give you that, yeah. Like, the, last year they proved a ton, even the year before. I know people don't want to go to the NIT, but it was they played for an NIT championship after you know winning like eight straight, and then you know going two years in a row they've been to the SEC tournament final. So they they these particular players and this program has proven more than than the last few years of A and M football. So it, it does. I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. How they're just the inconsistencies of it all. I thought you were gonna say, well, they could have also just as easily lost to Florida and been sitting at five and six right now. Um, but I think I, I don't question this team's toughness, no, and I don't no. question their desire. I do question their focus from time yeah, to time. F- I mean, some of these, like falling behind by twenty plus to U of H, and I know they had injuries in these games, and I get it. But that pattern, falling behind to them, falling behind. By twenty to Iowa State, um, never really being like, kind of that Virginia performance was like it wasn't. It was kind of they just got it handed to them there. It was Arkansas going down by twenty. It was LSU. You know the swing against the swing against Ole Miss, where it was like Ole Miss went. Were they was it a twenty to zero run? It was something close to a twenty to zero run to bridge both halves. Those and then it's Vandy performance. Those type of uh, I do think they're incons- frustratingly inconsistent, and they lose that edge and focus more than more than I'd like to see. To a point that well, and I th- you know it could keep them out of the tournament. It doesn't. It doesn't mean it has to. There's a lot of basketball to go. But if they don't make it, I think we'll look back and say mm-hmm. that's a big part of the reason. Well, why. the inconsistencies offensively is why this team can't lose focus because they're just not a reliable scoring team. Mm-hmm. When they're good, they're good. But when they miss, they miss a lot. Yeah, I just think they just had to put they, – they, here, here's my one sentence of last night. Two sentences. They needed to just go out there and play good basketball. They did not play good basketball by their standard. They, they played below standard – basketball I thought they got away with some of the things that make them successful yeah and I think you're right on it when you said for whatever reason they just always looked a step slower than Vanderbilt last night doesn't matter the opponent for this A&M basketball team if they lose the turnover battle and they lose the rebounding battle um, they're gonna lose games doesn't matter if they're playing Vandy Alabama doesn't matter. You, that's what they have to be great at every night. And that would be the clear. They actually had one more, more rebounds. rebounds. Yeah. But, offensive. yeah, Vanderbilt had more offensive, offensive rebounds. rebounds. And that, Vanderbilt's me. not a great rebounding team. No. Nope. So, again, it goes back to focus. All right, let's hit a break here. We'll close up with some uh, with Billy and with OB and talk some uh, Coach Elko football big picture stuff. Right now we're talking at Send Concrete Lifting and Support. Don't replace it. Lift it. The phone number is 979-933-8527. They're locally Aggie-owned and operated concrete lifting support company providing an easy, clean service at half the price of replacement. Your driveway is jacked. Get it lifted. You don't need to replace it and spend fifteen grand. No, you can do it for a fraction of that cost by just lifting it. Patio situation, same deal. You're a business owner. You've got some other issues you need to take care of. Let them come by and take care of the factory floors, the apartment complexes, the warehouse floors. How about an industrial municipal? Roads, streets, highways, bridges, approach. 
curb and gutters. They will take care of it all. That's what they do when they go there. Their service area is local, statewide, and nationwide. Again, that number, 979-933-8527. They can raise and stabilize any form of concrete. And once the project is finished, the appearance is close to seamless to the eyes and is quick too. You leave at 8 a.m., come back for lunch. Oh, you can already drive on the driveway. That's how it works. They're that quick when it comes to it. Again, 979-933-8527. Ascend concrete lifting and support. Don't replace it. Lift it. Welcome back into Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio. Billy's with us and OB for another segment. Brad Duncan on the YouTube page. Just finished the Elko interview. I get more and more impressed every time I hear him speak. And I think that's what I think all of us come away from, right? Press conferences. And look, they got to win on Saturdays. Yeah. That's the bottom line. But he's been winning. He's, he's dominating the offseason. Right. But it's the offseason. I think he has done a terrific job roster retention putting together his staff and the portal and and closing out the recruiting class mm -hmm. I, I think a tremendous job on all four of those fronts like a's and a pluses yep. across the board 
now comes the part that will you know really go a long way towards determining how this team does in year one under Mike Elko, which is the 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 heart of the off season. That's where you know he's setting the culture. Uh, they, he said they went out there yesterday, the first day, and it was it was Tommy Moffitt. It was the head coach. It's the coaches pushing and pushing, and and we've seen some of their social media. It definitely seems like it was a very rough day over there and kind of a rude awakening for a lot of guys, but not in a bad way. Yeah. Just like I think they all probably went home yesterday going, things are a lot different here now. The expectation level is higher. <laughs> the work requirement has gone up. I bet some of these, most of these guys are going to embrace that. Um, I think so. They want to win. Right. Everybody want you want to you want win. to be the best. They're going to have to push past that you know, and, that, and that's what's happening right now. They have to push past the hard part, and it'll stay hard. But they'll know after that that you know, like you just acclimate and you understand. You mentioned we're talking about buzz, and and that's what he has that boot camp for every year. Um, this is basically a, a couple month. It's a month boot camp until football season and then there'll be another one this I mean this will spring ball then there'll be another one this summer um this is the most important time because what Mike Elko is doing now is, is he is this is where the culture gets implemented this is where you start to develop that this is where Tommy Moffitt and you start seeing the real gains mm -hmm. physically for these football players and, and under a new SNC program so that that's what it is this is the most important part of the off season now. And listen, I think that interview with Elko, everyone's going to want to listen to it. Everyone's going to really enjoy it because I think a, you see the, you, you can really visualize the plan he has. Yep. You see the expectations, you see the organization. There's going to be no stone left unturned. You see the optimism, but also the realism that he's got, you know, he understands yep. the work ahead. He understands the challenge of the task, but he also believes they can do it. He truly believes that. And then you also get to see he's, you just listen to him talk, you understand how intelligent he is, but you also understand he's got a real sense of humor, a real good sense of humor that I think, you know, when he's a DC, you, if you knew him, you knew it, but the fans never really got to sit down and, and hear him talk and stuff, so they don't understand. This is a really funny dude that's got a really good dry sense of humor, too, and, and that goes a long way, I think, in terms of relationship. You have, uh, to like, you have to like, ultimately, you do have to like the person, too. You play for them, you work for them, all those things, you need to like them. Uh, Ag Engineering 12, Nuno, Billy OB, what are your thoughts on the Sips uh, playing on Thanksgiving Day? Are you kind of like Coach Elko? Line it up. Doesn't matter what day it is. No, no. I mean, I I'm not playing, so I don't. I don't have to feel like. So you like to have Thanksgiving? I like my I like my coach saying line it up. I don't yeah. care where. Um, I don't know where I stand about that yet. <clears throat> I, I kind of like it on Saturday if I'm I'm being real on it. <laughs> I agree. <coughs> you too. It's a holiday, and now. You know, now you got to go against the NFL games all mm -hmm. the time, and quite frankly, I, those players I would think would have would rather have an opportunity to, to spend more time with their families yep. and things. Well, like I also that. think it's such an important football game, and it should continue to uh, it better be important for both sides. That I, I'd rather p have a normal week of prep. I don't want yeah, some right. bastardized week yeah. of preparation, some shortened week for such a game of that magnitude. Like, I want, hey, both teams, this is how you prep for your other 11 games. Let's do it again for this one and see who the best team is. And you mentioned the NFL. Like, yeah, I, on a personal preference thing, I want to watch the Cowboys. I want to watch the Lions. Now, who whoever thought you'd say that? Maybe when Barry Sanders played, I want to watch the Cowboys. I want to watch the Lions. And then there's a third there's a game third now. game now, and I want to eat Thanksgiving yep. with family and friends. I and do. I, I know it's tradition. I know it was fun. Um, that's what I grew up on. But times change, and times have changed. And I think 
my preference from a football standpoint and a personal standpoint would be for that game to be on Saturday. I know a lot of Aggies will disagree. I know a lot of Longhorns will disagree. That's my preference. If you don't like it, here's the good news. I have no say in it. Well, selfishly, I'd like to not work on Thanksgiving Day and be with my family and then yeah. put all my focus. That's just a selfish part, yeah. part of it. You asked him a question about, you know, and I forgot how you phrased it, but where else could they dip into the portal potentially? Where would you like to see them maybe – Look. Um, I, I don't think it would hurt for them to add, you know, if they could go out and get a best available receiver. Mm -hmm. um, I think it continued to increase the competition maybe in the form of one more linebacker. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, it's more of like a best player available type thing. I, I think they're in pretty, they're in pretty good shape. When you look at like the players and what's coming back, but it, it, like he like he said, any position you can get better at, we don't shy away from competition. Let's get better. So, but I, I think receiver would be my number one. Uh, I don't think it's an absolute must, but I I think it would really be. Helpful. Yeah, I mean, I think you're good at receiver, but mm -hmm. why not be better? Yeah. In fact, I, Dave and I have talked about this before, and mm -hmm. I, I I think if you could tell me now that the offensive line is going to be significantly better and your corners are going to be significantly better. I'll yeah. take that with what I have left over. I mean, yeah. we've already already had not feel like I've a, I have a a 10-win team. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah. I uh I think it all boils down to that. And I and I've said this 100 times, I just think the coaching change will make all the difference in the world on the offensive line. I'm banking on it, I'm hoping on it, and I think that's what it comes down to for this team's success it be next very year. Very significant, yeah. All right, um, any final thoughts before we hit a break? I can always tell when you're ready. You know, um, again, yeah, you, you. We've, like we were you saying. You're sitting here, my phone's like, Dude. my mom said it was my birthday today on, <laughs> on Facebook, tags me in it, outs me on my age. I'm not that age yet because my birthday is not until tomorrow. Oh. So I'm getting all these happy birthdays on Valentine's Day, and my birthday is the 15th. All because my mom apparently doesn't remember what day it is. 39 years old. <coughs> Happy birthday, buddy. Thanks, Nunez. Yeah, appreciate that. OB, any final thoughts? No, just, I, how can I top that? You know, you can't. I probably knew you when I was 29. I met you before that, no? No, I'm saying 29, 39, 49. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's crazy. You know what popped up on my timeline yesterday? What? The original Texags radio at 1560 appearance from you and Gabe. Oh, wow. 2009. Did you not screenshot that? I, I don't know. It, it you just, 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 when you see one of those pop up, you just go, 2009. Deal with it later. I'll see if it's still, maybe, maybe there's a, it's still there. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, we'll hit a break here. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, OB. All right. Millican Reserve Time, Farm to Table Community and College Station. They got homes. They got trails. They got wide open spaces with a mission to build a healthy community around nature. They've done that by uh, trading lightly on that land creating a sanctuary for family, for nature, and for community. Uh, they're dedicated to the conservation of a beautiful and healthy community out there. 2,600 acres of open space. You've got 30 miles of trails. You've got awesome homes out there that I'll talk about in a minute. And they've got an extensive network of trails throughout a wooded landscape that includes walking, equestrian paths, creeks and ponds, and gathering areas. All the animals you can imagine are all out there hanging out all together, singing Kumbaya with Olin there at Millican Reserve. We're talking about the white-tailed deers. We're talking about the songbirds, the rabbits, the turtles, and homeowners at Millican Reserve sharing a legacy of conservation, which means generation after generation, you're coming back to that pristine countryside place. You've got awesome neighborhoods out there. You've got the creek on 10-plus acre wooded estates. You've got the hollow in a private gated community, and you've got the meadows that are responsive to those natural surroundings. You can learn more at MillicanReserve.com. Again, that website, MillicanReserve.com.
I love having a guy that I can argue with who knows way more than I do. Tom Schubert and I going back and forth on the end of games in basketball. He's a coach with a lot of experience. I'm just a dude who watches and plays good defense, by the way. Tom Schubert with us. Hey, how are you, sir? I'm doing great, David. Excited to be here, but disappointed in the game last night. That game sucked. And I never thought they were going to lose the game. There wasn't a point in that game, and I saw people tweeting, and I think even some people celebrating, which bugged me. But um, I never thought that they were going to lose that game, except when they hit the three. Right. And I'm like, uh-oh, we might lose this freaking game. But then we took the lead. And then, I mean, unfortunately, you let a bad team feel like they have a chance to win at home, and that's exactly what they did. Absolutely. I think uh, you give more credit to Vanderbilt than to what we didn't do. Uh, you know, they were in position all game where they could have taken the victory, and they did. The kid made a great play at the end. I don't think it was anything uh, bad that Texas A&M did. In fact, I thought the defense was really good at the end. They slowed him down. I think the kid got started a little late, but that's what he's really good at, getting in the lane and finishing. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's his like expertise. He's a 50-year guy, and he made a great play, but we made a good defensive play. We got a block, and it went right back in his hands, and he, he threw it up there with composure, and it went in, and that, that's what makes – you know, college basketball exciting, and it makes the difference in sometimes going to the NCAA tournament and sometimes sitting at home. Yeah, it's it's the weird thing to know that this team is so close to competing for the SEC and just a few hours later, so close to maybe being on the bubble again. Absolutely. I think uh, if they lose games that they're – uh, favored to win, uh, I could see us not getting in a tournament. But I, I don't see that happening. The one disappointment I had in last night's game, uh, like you said, I, I always felt like we weren't playing really great defensively, but we were staying in the ball game. So I thought we'll make plays and kind of get it going. Uh, but unfortunately, we weren't our best defensively, and that's unusual. The two times in the last two or three years where I felt like the other team might have dictated the energy mm -hmm. level was last night Vanderbilt started really yep. strong and they had a lot of energy and at home against LSU this year I thought like LSU kind of took it to us and I think Buzz even pointed that out that if there was one disappointment they just didn't bring that you know swagger that they've had when they're playing excellent defense and rebounding a basketball yeah I you a team like A&M that has Andy Garcia that has solo that 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 has Buzz as a head coach, cannot lose the offensive rebounding battle, cannot have more turnovers, because that's how they beat you, right? Um, that's what they do. And if that's not working, you're going to rely on offense? Like, you, you have to have that with some offense. You said it perfectly. I mean, that's uh, Texas A&M's uh, MO. They're going to out-rebound you. They're going to out-hustle you. They're going to play solid defense, and they're not going to turn the ball over. The fact that Vanderbilt only had four turnovers, that surprised me. I was hoping we could kind of confuse them a little bit, speed them up, but they did a good job. And the, the thing I like to tell fans when, when I was in the coaching seat is that there's two teams out there, and I've said that to you many mm -hmm. times. So it's not necessarily the inability of what A&M didn't do. I give credit to Vanderbilt, and uh, again, they've had a tough year, but that's a tough place to play. You can say what you want. It's a, it's a weird uh, confinement. Just the fact that the benches are at the end is a little confusing, but it's, a, it's kind of a straight up, it's almost like an elevator shaft, right. you know, and it's a weird place to play. I've played in there four, four times in my career, uh, and back then Vanderbilt had really good teams and great support. What was interesting, you know, they, they've drawn, you know, a couple thousand people at a game that seats 15,000 uh, seats. So uh, it's not the hardest environment because of the fans being on you. Buzzer beater losses, both to teams that are not very good. Right. Arkansas, not very good. Bandy, not very good. Ole Miss, pretty good. I wouldn't call that a buzzer beater, but you lost it at the end. Right. Um, you know, I looked at it, I, I hear everybody talk about the games we lost at the buzzer, but we forget about the two we won. And yeah. ironically, 
those two teams that we beat, which were better teams, Kentucky and Florida, they controlled the game. At the end, they had the ball in each last possession, and they didn't win. So, you know, you can talk about those. We could have lost those and be 0-5. We could have won these three, be 5-0, and and it'd be a whole different story. But the fact that we're in games, we just got to close a little better against teams we're better than. And it's clearly we're better than LSU and Vanderbilt. You know, Ole Miss, I thought they won the game. I don't think we lost it. The kid made a huge three at the top of the key, you know, and, and we weren't able to, you know, overcome that. So, that play was, I mean, like, I wish it didn't come down to that play because I thought a and played excellent defense on that play. I did not like the offensive philosophy there. Let me just dribble, dribble, and see if I can get in the middle, throw up a prayer. It worked. So tip of the cap. It shouldn't have come down to that play, but it did. Right. Again, we've got to out-rebound people, turn them over, and then play solid uh, on the defensive end. You don't want to rely on your offense when it's inconsistent. Although... You know, we have elite players. What I was impressed with when we fell behind three in a corner, that's the first time I thought we were going to lose. And then we come down, get fouled immediately. And I thought one of the fouls was questionable. I, the one with Radford at the end, I liked the fact attack in the basket. I, I was reading. The some, one he got hit in the place you shouldn't get hit, that one? Correct, yeah, yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, you know, the, the rule used to be you can pick a free throw shooter and walk him up there. So sometimes a bad free throw shooter would get fouled and you'd say, hey, stay down, you're hurt. You know, now the rule is the opposition could pick anybody on the bench. You right. don't have to pick someone in the game. So he was getting up because you would have probably just looked at the stat sheet, picked someone that was cold and throw him in his home. But that's big to make four free throws down the stretch like that. So it gave us a chance. So I know it's disappointing, but they can overcome it by winning the games they need to yeah. and then maybe sneak well, up at somebody. We're going to go through that in a second. But, but, Tom, this is another game, though. They're not hitting – shots at the end of games right like look we, we tell it like it is when they're yeah. good there, there's a lot of things to point at yesterday they weren't good and they still had a chance to win and I wish they would have won but you you've got to hit buckets not just free throws correct and uh you know I again three ways to stop A&M if I'm the opposition I'm playing Texas A&M number one is I would make Radford a shooter more of a three-point shooter when he gets to the basket he's as good as anybody in the country and he's so Unorthodox. He can get a shot off against anybody yep. and make it, not just get it on the board. And then uh, you can't allow Wade to get a rhythm three or get a lot of threes. You got to make him drive without fouling him. You know, I don't think he can beat you if you don't foul him. He's going to make a, a large percentage, but I don't think he'll beat you in an entire game. He's great at getting fouled, and then keep. Uh, Washington off the boards. Those things are hard to do. Unfortunately, we didn't. Uh, you know do it last night like we normally have, and we didn't play defense. All right, let's uh, put up the schedule because they've got six wins now in the SEC. And if you're the way a talk show host thinks, how do they get into the tournament? We, before you get to the SEC tournament, do they have four more wins on their schedule considering they still got Bama, they got Tennessee, they got South Carolina, and you still got to go on the road to Georgia and, and Ole Miss? Well, I think the Alabama game on the road, obviously, and Tennessee, the fact that we beat them so bad here, those are going to be difficult to win. Yep. Um, Georgia, that, that's the game there that, you know, winnable. You know, the odds makers are the best at telling you who's the favorite. So when that game comes, I would think that's going to be around, a, you know, probably an even game. So that's a huge game. And then that Ole Miss, uh, you know, us losing here, uh, I think it almost helps you going on the road. You know, I know it sounds crazy. You've already lost to them. But you know, good teams find a way to respond just like uh – you know, we did at LSU. Um, I thought that was a great uh, comeback there. I think we've got at least four wins left in us. I really do. Uh, you know, the, I think the three games that, you know, we probably won't be favored in are the ones we just talked about, Alabama and Tennessee. Um, I think we'll beat South Carolina here. I'm looking forward to that. In fact, that's one team right now. that They've got two losses. My prediction is they'll have six or seven losses at the end of the season. Oh, really? I think their schedule is not favorable right now yep. down the stretch, and now they're being the hunted like we have been in the past when we're up at the top of the standings. It's so much easier to play – from the bottom of the uh, standings, you don't always get the next team's best game. That's, again, my opinion, but I think it, it shows out after you look at the long haul of the season. Why do you think certain teams, and I will say this about a buzz team, whenever you think you can write them off, then they come back and they do the Tennessee game, right? So well, why do you think this team is so good at that? 
Uh, I think like a healthy chip on their shoulder, and I think that's their identity. You yeah. know, every team is an identity. You know, if you look at talent, and I don't mean to diminish our guys, but we kind of have that blue collar, uh, you know, win at all costs, do what you have to to uh, win, where other teams rely more on like offensive skills or they've got maybe more NBA prospects. And so I think we've got to have that chip on our shoulder, and that's what we've always done. I like – when our backs are against the wall. We don't seem to disappoint. Last night was a little bit of a disappointment, but again, we go to Knoxville on Saturday and win. I mean, it's almost, you'd, you'd rather do that, win at Knoxville and lose in Nashville. So uh, who knows? But I don't think we're going to lose any more games that we're supposed to win. Well, if I'm playing a and I'm making them shoot outside no matter what. It's not just boots, right? Like I'm like, all right, let's just build a, little, a wall. We're going to build a wall. Around the paint. I don't know why I got so excited there. And we're going to make you shoot on us only. We're just, okay, drive all you want, but we got four guys waiting for you. Absolutely. I mean, that's what I would do. You know, I, it's funny. I look at the game sometimes like what I would do as a coach. So it's not necessarily fair to the other team or the coach or, you know, I, that's how I like to look at it. But when a guy like Solomon Washington shoots a three, and I know he shoots a decent percentage, as an opposition coach, I'm happy. Number one, it may go in every now and then. He doesn't shoot a high percentage. Uh, and, and, I'm, and also uh, Anderson Garcia, those two guys. But it takes them off the boards. So now, you know, the best thing they do is rebound. So now they basically volunteered the fact that they're not going to go to the boards for you. So it's kind of, a, you know, it helps you out. Uh, that's what good teams try to do. Make the other team do what they're not good at. Um, again, I'm not saying those other players shouldn't shoot the ball, but I love when we get way good looks. I love when Boots gets the ball to the basket. I mean, he is so hard to stop. And then the fact that he makes key free throws. I mean, he's only shooting – he's under 70%, but when one's on the line, he makes it usually. And that's, that's a credit to him and his competitiveness. So um, it's going to be an interesting seven games down the stretch, that's for sure. So – are you are you worried they're gonna make not make the tournament? Or are you not there yet? I'm not there yet. I I mean, if we falter on a game we're supposed to win, then uh, we're in trouble. Because in fact, I'm surprised with our preseason schedule that we're considered still a bubble team at this point because we've had some good wins. Unfortunately, some, some bad losses. Uh, we have. And that's what the committee looks at more than good wins, believe it or not. If you don't have bad losses, but you have a, a, a you know, your one loss record isn't as good as maybe another team's, you don't get um, – they don't look as poorly on you. So losing those bad losses have hurt us. At the same time, some of the wins we had early, some of those teams haven't been doing very well. And then we lost, like, for example, Memphis, who's not having a very good year right now. Yeah. You know, when we beat Ohio State, I thought, man, that was a great win. You know, they're they're in jeopardy of, you know, being under 500. So there's a lot of things that happen towards the end of the year that you don't expect in the beginning because – Things change, and um, we're obviously uh, what's happened to us right now. Yesterday's the first game I feel like in a long time where I didn't look at Andy Garcia, Anderson Garcia, and be like, man, what a game. Like, I mean, he had some moments, there's no doubt about it, but like only six rebounds. Like, it, it just didn't seem like you get, you get so used to like, hey, he's 15 rebounds, 17 rebounds. I know. Uh, I agree. Again, I wonder if that was one of Vanderbilt's concerns. I'm sure it was. I don't know if they maybe assigned a guy to him when the ball went up. Uh, it would be interesting to know their strategy. Uh, he also, I love how he plays to, you know, his emotions and the energy. You know, at home, you know, the crowd we had in here for, uh, Saturday night with Tennessee. I mean, those guys were just great, and we got off to the good start. Um, when you're playing on the road and you didn't bring the energy that you probably should have, uh, you know, those things can happen. Vanderbilt hung around, and I think any inferior team, they talk 
as a staff for sure of shortening the game. Yep. You make any game a five minute game, you can beat, you know, the world champion Denver Nuggets, you know, you you, me and three other guys if we get, nah. get uh, maybe if we're making shots, you know. So <laughs> they ain't making shots. I'm kidding. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tom. Appreciate you, sir. Thank you. Tom Schubert here. All right, we're gonna hit a break. We'll come back. We'll actually check in with Nick and with Eric Casares. We've gone an hour and forty eight minutes and haven't said a word to those guys. So we'll do that when we come back. Right now, do you know someone or a graduate from AM within the last 12 years that is leading by example and by business. If so, the Association of Former Students says, hey guys, we want you to nominate yourself or someone you know for the 12 under 12 young alumni spotlight. Each year, the association recognizes a dozen Aggies who have graduated within the last 12 years for their business accomplishments, civic or military service, philanthropic efforts, and outstanding representation of AM's core values of excellence, integrity, leadership, loyalty, respect, and of course, selfless service. Previous year honorees have included leaders in business, higher education, architects, petroleum, engineers, nonprofit executives, physicians, veterans, and members of the U.S. Armed Forces. 2024 nominations close Sunday, March 31st. Be sure to submit a nomination soon. To learn more about that recognition or submit a nomination, visit tx.ag slash 12 under 12 nominations. Again, that is visit tx.ag slash 12 under 12 nominations. I have failed you people. I apologize. Actually, I failed Nick. We got our YouTube, like, we had, like, people, like, 
on the YouTube page who aren't normally here, right? Like, oh, Coach Oko, we got to watch that. T- Texas fan, LSU fan, Alabama fan, A&M fan, right? You guys got to like and subscribe. Subscribe for me. We've been stuck at 13.9 thousand subscribers for too long. Guys, we're too big of a deal. Not me, but Tech Sags and Billy and the whole gang, right? Like, too big of a deal to be stuck at a number for, for a couple weeks. Let's get, let's get over that 14,000 plateau, guys. If you're listening right now, even on another platform, just go subscribe to that channel. We're trying to grow it, trying to do some good things for you guys. And uh, so appreciate everybody listening in this morning. We have not gone to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Aggies gather at the Angry Elephant. Eric Casares typically has a, a word or two for us. But Eric, it has been busy, busy. I know we got some text messages, right? Yeah, we do. We got some several text messages. First of all, Brad from Brenham saying, hey, David, great interview. Uh, he's talking about Elko. He said, I think he will be smart. What if he was talking about me? Maybe he liked my tone, my diction. He, he my, might have. I mean, I, I like your tone. I like your... What's that word, diction? Yeah, I don't know if that should work there, but yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, but I, I respect it. Uh, he said uh, it would be smart enough to be available at TechSags often. TechSags is such a huge asset from the supporters of the program. Thank you, TechSags team. No, no. Thank you to Coach Elko. My voice cracked there. Thank you to AC for getting that done. Look, I've been here now three years, right? It's about to be three years, and Coach... Uh, Jimbo did come in once while I was here, so I was very appreciative when he came in. Uh, look, I'm trying to get to know Coach Elko, and I will tell you in my few encounters with him, the dude's great. Like, I like, I like him. It's, it's, I'm going to explain it like this. It's like Schloss in the fact that I, like, I just like Schloss as a person. I like him as a leader, and I like the direction we're going. At the end of the day, you're going to be judged by your wins and your losses. But from everything that I can see, right, I like it. I do. Jimbo was nice to me. I never felt like I broke the wall that he, you know, we, we, I could fist pound the dude, but like he, he was great. He was fine. I got no problems with, with Jimbo. I think that's what's really important too about uh, football coaches that are, when they're interviewing with like broadcasters and journalists, like it's not just always about like, I'm not in football mode. It's like, he really does feel like he's just like a down to earth type of guy to talk about with anything. So I'm really excited to see what he can do for A&M. Look, questions and answers are cool in February. And I appreciate the ability to do that. And really, they're going to be cool as we head to games and after games, right? That's all. That's fun. I care about what I'm being told about the culture. And I do believe Jimbo did fix a little bit of the culture issues that were there last year. But you are who you are, right? And if you expect for things to change with a lot of the same methodology, things don't change. Which is why when Billy was talking about, you know, Maybe it was a wake-up call for some of these guys yesterday when they're getting these workouts. And this is a good thing, right? Like, it would be a shock to the system if tomorrow there's a new chief of staff of Texas, and they're like, all right, everybody, everybody's got to be here at 6 a.m. You got to have your TPS reports in by 7 a.m. And we got to do it. Like, it would be... But if we are trending in an area and if we're, we're building towards something bigger and better, guess what? We all buy in. All right, this is what it's going to take to be a champion. We're going to go do it. And that's what I hope is happening across the street. I expect that it's happening across the street. And you want to call us maroon sunshine pumpers? I don't know. I like the guy. I like the direction they're going. I like the talent that they have across the street. Now let's go do it. And they've got a few months to build that to a better thing. When we come back on this show that we call Texax Radio, we're going to talk to Ryan Broninger, Recruiting Country, the Lobby Lizard, next on Texax.
We're back here on Tex Ags Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio, time for Recruiting Country, brought to you by Caprock Health System, a faster patient-centered revolution in care with two ERs in the Bryan College Station area. You've got the original 24-hour ER in South College Station on William D. Fitch and the full-service hospital with ER in Bryan on Briarcrest. Online at caprockhealthsystem.com. David Nuno, Ryan Broninger is with us. What's Good up? morning. I think I'm going to start by taking a page from Coach Elko and saying happy Valentine's Day to my wife, Ashley. I love you. Is she listening? I, I don't know, but it's better so, safe than sorry, right? right. Okay. Have you told Elizabeth? No. I mean, I did this morning. Okay. Woke her up with, you know, soft lullabies. Actually. Oh, did you? No. In I, English I or in Spanish? In in French, actually. I've been oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> wow. French, like, yeah. like, it was Mardi Gras yesterday, yeah. so you've been working on your French. Je m'appelle Guillaume. Et vous? Oh, look at you. My well, name listen, is William. And yours? If, um, you know, if you're spending this day and you have somebody that cares about you, Regardless of who that person is, you should feel blessed, right? If somebody yes. reaches out and, and just tells you happy Valentine's Day and just maybe they want to get you something small as a gift just to show their appreciation, whether they love you or not, they just want to be a kind human being and show their appreciation, receive that well, right? It's just as important to, to receive that as well as people give it. So Give and receive. Right, right. There's, there's re, it's Reciprocity of this is very important. So, you know, there may be some people walking around this office that have received Valentine's Day gifts today. They're, you know, quite frankly, a little unappreciative. Yeah. So I just want to make sure maybe if they're listening in the office that they hear that and, and maybe they can take it throughout their day as well. I was a little surprised you didn't wear red or pink today. I, I would have expected that from you today. You know, my color wheel stays the exact same. And by color wheel, I mean the stuff that I wear. It goes on my body, into the dirty clothes bin, into the washing machine, into the dryer, back into the same bin where it was once dirty, and then I pick it out of there and we start the whole process. Over. Start the whole process over. Uh, not that I want to get too in the, in the woods with the Coach Elko interview, but I know you listened to it. I know you chatted with him a little bit in the lobby. But, like, I'm just – I'm imagining how his message is being received at homes, right? Because if I'm over here listening to him, and I'm like, I really like this guy. And every press conference I've been around and every conversation I've had, I really like this guy. Like, he seems real. He th- seems he seems like I can touch, right? Like, and he's there. Like, I'm assuming that's how it is with these, these families. Yeah, it doesn't seem like he's built on cliches, right? right? Some pre-rehearsed stuff that he's gone over in his head. Like, you can ask him about recruiting. You can ask him about NIL. You can ask him about the state of college baseball and because he's familiar with it, he can answer those questions Mm -hmm. and off the cuff and does a really good job with it. Like this is the stuff that I kind of had an insight to because of my relationship with him and and his son uh, when they were here the first time, I knew he would be a huge hit here with the fan base. He's just, he's a real human being, man. Like he's a real dude. And you hear that coming off these visit weekends. You hear that coming off of, we've heard it from the Texas high school coaches association, just how open and honest and genuine he's been. Uh, with everybody that he's come in contact with since he's been the head coach here. And you, I kind of had a feeling it was going to go that way, and I knew how hard he was going to work for this place. And I knew how much uh, being the head coach here would mean to him, and I, I knew how serious he would take the job. And, you know, one of the things he said in his op- introductory press conference is that there's no elevator to this thing. Like, you have to take the stairs. And so these days that he's going over there and they're running strength and conditioning workouts, and they're just – that's culture-building days. So – Whatever happens on the field this fall, these days right now in February and March leading into spring practice are might be as important as what happens when fall camp starts, right? Because yep. you have to start rebuilding the culture here. And I, I've been – just the stuff that we've heard around town, like been really impressed with the way he's gone about it. And I think right now – to me, I, I don't know. I didn't listen to all of it because I was upstairs doing some stuff. But to me, it seems like now – that there's not a ton of recruiting stuff going on, and we'll get into that in just a second. But it seems like now that there's not a lot of recruiting stuff going on in terms of the calendar, I think he's really enjoying this time because it's now it's like, all right, all that's done. I got my staff. We recruited the heck out of the 24s and ended up signing, got it to the finish line with Terry and Ashton Bethel Roman and, and uh, Robbie Bourdon. And then I, I did a great – Is it Bourdon? Is that how you yeah, say Yeah, Robbie. Uh, that's how he was pronouncing it in the, in the press I conference. Know, I know. But – then you think about the roster retention and then the work they did in the portal and just how every day, every waking hour, he had to spend on that kind of stuff and not with his team, not building his culture. So I would imagine that to him, these days are super important and they're way more fun than the days that he's had leading up to this point just because of what the day-to-day looks like. And now he can finally 
start coaching football. Yeah. You know, so I think as a football coach, you always are itching to coach football. And he understands that there's a million other things that go along with that now in this day and age of college football. But I think at his core, he wants to be out there coaching his team. So you mentioned that a lot going on recruiting wise. What does like what does it look like for them across the street right now? Yeah, I think right now it's a lot of player evaluations on the class of twenty twenty five setting their big board uh, at every position and then mapping out, okay, we really like this kid. I always use your twins as an example. We really like Christian Nuno, but I, where are we at in terms of can we get him? We really, really like him. We think he's an impact player here. Can we get him? Here's Cruz Nuno. Man, I, I, we, we think we can get him. Is he a fit here? Right. So there's a lot of that background going on. Do you know how they break that down? Like, is it like... Well, that's part of the organizational structure that he's got. Like, he's got people dedicated to that, to really digging in on these kids. And obviously, you have to meet a certain watermark talent-wise to be recruited by Texas A&M. But from there, and I think with as much emphasis as he's putting on culture right now, he has to get that right. So, you know, you didn't see them reach on questionable character kids late in the recruiting cycle in December and also in February. You know, Terry Bussey's off the charts as, as yep. a kid. Ashton Bethel Roman, super quiet, you know, doesn't say much, kind of keeps to himself. Robbie Bourdon, by all accounts, like super high academic kid that was recruited by Stanford and Duke and Northwestern and Michigan and like really prestigious academic universities. Uh, so I think that that component of recruiting is vitally important to what he's doing and vitally important to his staff and how they go about their evaluation. So that's an, this is an important time for that because they're going to start calling about kids and calling coaches. Maybe they get on the phone with teachers. Maybe they get on the phone with trainers and coaches and uh, you know youth football coaches just to get a better idea and better feel for what this kid brings to the table off the field. And ideally, in every sport, what you really, really want is super talented, low-maintenance players, right? That's right. – Low maintenance is one of the most sought after traits, I think, outside of raw talent. Okay, he's raw talent. Then is he high maintenance? Am I going to deal with him in my office two or three times a week? Is mom and dad going to be upset and wanting to call and talk to me about something that happened in the weight room? Like, or is he low maintenance? Is he, is he going to go about his business? I won't hear from him. He's going to show up on time. He's going to go to class. He's going to go to workouts. He'll stay extra and do the extra work. That, th- those are low maintenance kids, and that's a really – highly sought after trait, not only in sports, but in the job world too, right? So during the Jimbo era, I forget how you phrased it. You got to sell, you had to sell the steak eventually, not just the sizzle, right? right? And there, there weren't the results the last couple of years. And we kept on saying you win these games, what it can mean for a recruiting class. For Coach Elko going into next year, he's got to A, prove to some folks that it's going to work here. But what does a winning season look like for Coach Elko's recruiting? Because once he proves, hey, I told you it was going to work, and now it's working. Yeah, you know, I think year one results, a, a good season would just be a cherry on top. Like, it'd be Lanyap, right? Because I think they're going to put together the recruiting class uh, on the basis of a vision. And because it's new, much like when Jimbo's message was new, there's some sizzle to it, Yeah. right? And there's people that are going to be patient with the results, and they understand that he's trying to rebuild, number one, rebuild a culture. And then number two, rebuild a football team and get it – uh, up and firing on, on the cylinders that he expects it to from an offensive and defensive efficiency standpoint yep. and how they operate. Uh, but the first thing is changing that culture. And they under, people understand that takes time. And, and I know in a microwave society right now that we've got in the ever-changing world of college football in terms of the roster and what you can do in one offseason to completely flip it, people expect results quicker. And, you know, I've been on record a, a bunch of times that just because you have nice things and they have really nice things across the street, I mean, every day you pull into work – you see the, the cranes and the bulldozers and yep. the excavators moving and more beams going up. But just because you have nice things doesn't give you a right to win things. It does raise the expectation level, though. And I think he talked to a little bit about that uh, as well. But I think having all that stuff going on helps with his vision. Uh, that People can say what they want, and I do think that NIL has probably stepped in front of facilities, but facilities are – not completely off the table in terms of importance for for kids and families and you know they especially parents want their kids to be sent to a place that in every aspect of their life they're going to be taken care of so 
if you've had to cut corners on some facility stuff because to fund other things, you know, is your training staff up to the task of managing a roster of 120 guys that are right. hurt and banged up? And, you know, it, it just gives, I think, parents and the folks that are close to these recruitments a lot more peace of mind whenever you've got the facilities to help them in every facet of their life. And a has got that. Um, but I do think a successful year on the field will help. I don't think a run-of-the-mill seven and five is going to hurt. You know what I'm saying? Like, I right. think there's they're going to do a good enough job of building relationships and selling the vision that I think they can withstand some of that. And I think they're in a good, really good spot with some of their top targets uh, as we head into the spring here. All right. Uh, you had a piece that came out yesterday, I believe, in one of the first lines you mentioned Adam Cushing, Sean Spencer, Tony Drodetti, um having their work cut out because obviously it being a line of scrimmage league. They've done such a good job in years past of recruiting there, but that that grind does not stop, Bonnie. Yeah, you number one, I said that they had their work cut out for them, not because I think they're poor recruiters at all. I, I, their work, they have their work cut out for them because there is a prerequisite that you land and sign highly talented players <clears throat> that can provide instant impact, but also quality depth in this league. Like you cannot win in this league without quality depth and talent along both lines of scrimmage. That's not a cliche. That is a fact. We know that. So <clears throat> I wasn't trying to take a shot at any of those three right, coaches. Right, right. And, but what I'm saying is, like, as the page is now fully turned to the class of 2025 because, you know, 2024 is completely over with, we can start honing in on those names that – uh, that the staff is already focusing on, and then the, we feel like that A&M's got a good chance at landing. And if, you know, you can go through that list, and I, I, I rattled off 12 names because that's kind of what we do here is things in 12, but I went six offensive linemen and six defensive linemen that as things stand today in February, and we know that nailing down recruiting, especially this far away from signing day, that's, a, that's an impossible target to hit 100%. But – I do think I, we were able to, and I, Jason gave me some help, especially because it's kind of DFW heavy on the offensive line. Uh, we were able to nail down where we think their priorities lie right now. And that could certainly change as they get out uh, to these high school campuses and watch these kids work out. There are a lot of offers that have gone out based on tape watched uh, and very little in-person evaluations because that's what you have to do during the off season. You don't, you're in a dead period. You can't get out to high schools to watch them work out. The stops that Elko made whenever he was first hired, most of those football periods do not involve football stuff because they're just ending their seasons, right? So it's mostly weight room stuff, but right. there's very little football stuff being done during those athletic periods. And so when they go out right now or in the spring and they go see kids, now they're going to see them with their own eyes, make their own evaluations based on how they do some football stuff. So – that list that we've kind of pieced together just based on different conversations we've had with sources in Houston and Dallas and San Antonio across the state, uh, and even some industry folks that have helped us out with, you know, some kids in Florida that AM's really interested in, some kids in Cali that AM's yep. really interested in. So we've been able, Jason and I have been able to kind of piece together a board uh, that helps us out going into the spring. And so based off of that, I came up with that list of 12 names of offensive and defensive linemen that I think A&M's got a great shot at landing. Well, let me throw you a couple of the names out there before we hit our, our first break. Um, the prosper offensive lineman, Connor, is it Cardi? Cardi. So Connor, Con Connor Cardi is a really interesting kid because he's an interior offensive line prospect that I think could be a really, really good center prospect. What people don't know about him is he is a really quality athlete. Uh, and when you look at him, you're going to go, okay, like big, thick offense, interior offensive lineman. But from what I understand, like he can really jump. Like he can dunk a basketball, flat-footed dunk a basketball. Um, some of his testing numbers are really impressive in terms of his mobility and, and agility. Uh, and I think maybe the fan base – everybody's getting used to these names right now. It's, they're, we're just, like I said, we're Turn flipping the page, the page yeah. to this cycle. Connor Cardi's one that uh, – Jason and I are going to talk a lot more about because I think just based on the conversations we've had, I think he's rapidly rising up A&M and a lot of other folks recruiting boards across the, across the region because 
coaching staffs are finding out like, hey, this isn't just like a really technically proficient kid uh, at a good quality high school program. Like this is a kid with really high athletic upside as well. Did you say flat-footed dunk of basketball at 6'4", 285? Yes. Good God. I haven't seen him do it. Just what people yeah, have told Yeah, but that's Jason what to say. Yeah, that's amazing. And you know who else was a really – like a big-bodied offensive lineman who was a really – Impressive basketball player. Ruben Fathery. Ruben, but Ruben's big and long, right? right? right he was 6'7. Right. Jarvis Harrison out of Navasota. Oh, okay. And that was one of the things that I think when Jim Turner was here and recruited him, they were like, man, like, how many 6'4, 330 pounders you see jump and reverse layup and stuff like that? So there is some kind of correlation to that kind of bouncy athleticism right. on the basketball floor for the for a offensive lineman. Uh, to it replicating itself or, or manifesting itself uh, in the trenches. How about Port Nichols Grove uh, offensive lineman Jackson Christian? Yeah, so obviously had a huge year for PNG, led them to a state championship, and has kind of steadily seen his stock rise. He's going to measure in like a tackle, six foot five, three hundred ten pounds, really good long wingspan, giant, powerful hands, and in a similar fashion to Robbie Bourdon, like off the charts academically extremely smart kid plays with a ton of power I think he's got an offensive tackle checklist in terms of physical attributes but plays more like an interior guy I think the staff likes his versatility um, and I, he's a kid that A&M and Texas are both after and I, it, I think it could end up being a dogfight okay let's hit a break Maybe do one or two more offensive linemen, then hit the defensive line. If you got any questions for Bronny, you can do it by texting us up at 979-693-1150. This is Recruiting Country, brought to you by Caprock Health System.
All right, we're back here on Tech Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. We are here in the Rollo Insurance Studio. It is Recruiting Country, brought to you by Caprock Health System, David Nuno, Ryan Broninger. And we go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Eric Casares has got a text message for us. David Edmond said, What Bronny was saying about having nice things equaling wins is best portrayed in the great 80s movie Rocky Three. Rocky had the money trained infants prepared by Clubber. Did you know, have you watched Rocky Three, by the way? Me? Yeah. Yes, very long time ago. I actually rewatched the first two not too long ago, all but right. I forgot the third one. I was about to make fun of him, but he he, he passed. I, they all run together in my brain. It's not something really? I regularly watch. I mean, I've seen every one of them, but like they run together. But like, who does he fight in two? Uh, Apollo Creed. Who is he fighting for? Ivan Drago. Okay, so you're very yeah. much more invested. Like, but yeah. they kind of run together. No, no, me. they don't at all. They're different chapters. Different. This is oh, here we go. Uh, uh, 80s, 80s guy. No, here it, comes 80s guy. We're still living it right now with the Creed series. Get it out. It's it is about the American dream, and sometimes you go punchy and you find your way back. That's what it's about. Well, there was an altercation in the lobby earlier between um, one of the bosses here and an employee here. He put his hands on him and. and you know, I, I I gave the employee here some not some boxing advice like, hey, against a guy like that, you got to rope a dope. He'll tire quickly. You know. Yeah. His his cardio is not up to snuff. Did you see me post my picture with my good friend Carl Weathers the other day? Oh, I did not see you post a picture yeah. with Chubbs. Um, well, he's Apollo Creed in my book. I mean, he, he's just a legend. But yes, back in 2017, Philadelphia NFL draft, the day that Deshaun Watson was drafted. Oh, yeah. I did the red carpet show uh, for the draft, and yeah. he was one of those that walked by and uh, got an interview and a picture with good well, old Carl cool. Weathers. Pretty cool. That, well, I'm not going to make an off color joke because you're talking about a man who recently passed, but I had a just know that I had a Deshaun Watson joke. Did you have one ready? In my back pocket there. Well, I'm so happy we're Pat ready. myself on the back for keeping it clean. So uh, about what he said there, David Edmonds' thoughts there, it is true that like, and that was kind of one of the reasons I asked Coach Elko, but like, what, you know, when we talk about these resources, what does that mean, right? And, and he answered it about like, we, we still haven't done it yet. We got to go do it, right? But they do have everything that they need, but it doesn't matter. If you're not doing the taking the stairs approach that you talked about, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Yeah, those th kind of things can um, massage your ego. Oh, uh, <coughs> Lim Buchanan joke. You did the look, you did the whole thing. All right, we're going to get back to the list here, shall we? Um, I could, I'm too immature to just sit on it the whole time. Michael Fasusi? Yeah, super. I mean, impressive kid out of Louisville. Louisville. And a lot of folks think he is the best offensive tackle prospect in the country. Wow. I, I wouldn't argue with you if you said that. But there are also two other ones in Dallas that could make a similar claim to just being the best offensive tackle prospect in Dallas this cycle means you're probably the best offensive tackle prospect in the country. And there's three guys that have got a real claim to it mm -hmm. in Fasusi, Ty Haywood at Denton Ryan, and Lamont Rogers at Mesquite Horn. All three of those guys, I think the Aggie coaching staff, Adam Cushing, would jump through hoops to get and would just be over the moon happy with if, if, if this recruiting class, if they can somehow find a way to land two of those three, holy cow. Like, those are all three elite offensive tackle prospects that are projected as multi-year starters at the next level, at the highest level. So, if a and able to, number one, continue their resurgence in Dallas in general, you know, across all positions, yep. but number two, go in there and land two of those three – that would be a giant flag in the ground for Adam Cushing and Mike Elko in this recruiting cycle. Let's move to the defensive line. South Oak Cliff defensive end, Cameron Morgan. Kamaran Morgan. Oh, Kamaran. Okay. See, these are all new names, so yeah. we're going to have to get you up to snuff. Uh, yeah, Kamara Morgan mo is moving to Sock from Red Oak. He played his junior year at Red Oak. I talked to Jason about him yesterday. He's got a lot of family ties to the South Oak Cliff program, so he's moving there as a senior. Reminds me a lot of Malik Silla. Okay. as a prospect when Malik was coming out. Very similar build, very similar play style. So kind of a long, sleek pass rusher, but not a stand-up kid. You know, he's going to have his hand in the ground and play that way. Uh, the coaching staff really likes him. He seems to have a, an early affinity for A&M and has always liked the idea of playing football at A&M regardless of right. who the coach was. So, uh, again, another highly sought-after kid in Dallas that 
A&M could really flip the script in DFW with, with kind of how things had been going up there. Uh, they could flip that script this cycle if, if they can go in there and make some noise. All right, this next one comes from basically an Ivy League school in uh, in A Leaf, Texas. Hastings defensive end Smith Oragbo. Yeah, and I figured that you would be a big fan of this kid, and I am too, because he is an absolute menace on tape. When you look at the arc of his recruitment, he went from almost completely unknown in November to one of the most highly offered kids in the state of Texas just in a two, three month span. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he did that because his tape is really impressive. It's He's six foot four, two twenty. So when I say this comparison, A and M comparison, don't take it out of context because this guy was way bigger. But he plays similar to Michael Clemens. No. Like it's just violent and like terrorizing and kind of no regard for what's in front of him and just bullies people, right? And but does it with some twitch and some athleticism and some power. Uh, I really like him as a defensive end prospect. Landon Rink's a name we've mentioned before on this show. Yeah, and all Landon Rink has done at Cy Fair is set a school record in the last two weeks, both in the bench press and in the squat. And at a school like Cy Fair that's had some real athletes come yeah. through there, uh, you know, you think about just their line of scrimmage, you got Austin Deculus, who was a four-year starter at LSU. Uh, and I think the numbers for rank were four, 410 on the bench press and 605 in the squat for school records. That's a junior in high school bench press and 410 and squat and 605. And when you turn the tape on, that power is abundantly clear he forklifts people dude like he gets underneath them and just leverages them and recreates lines of scrimmage against some of the best offensive lines in the city of houston really good player uh super high motor if you can think about this a and fan so i'm trying to do a and comparisons for all these kids and i hope he's not listening Way better version of Spencer Neely coming out of high school. Okay. Way better version. And probably not as big as Spencer. Like, Landon's going to be 6'2 and some change. Um, but, man, he is extremely gifted. And, you know, Dad played at Texas, but Landon has been very open about going to school, the school that best fits him. Uh, and if you're asking me right now, Texas A&M is very much amongst those schools he's looking at uh, and could even be at the top of his list. Kind of, You'd have to ask Landon that. But – uh, sensational player, really good player. And I think when I'm looking at the city of Houston and, and kind of my big board on who I'd like to see A&M land, Landon Rink might be at the top. All right, what about PAM's Michael Riles? Uh, <clears throat> so, Port Arthur Memorial. Yeah, Mike is probably the best prospect in Southeast Texas in this recruiting cycle. Reminds me a little bit of a Dalen Evans, smaller built Dalen Evans, but his frame's going to hold 260, 270, Makes a ton of plays in the backfield. The coaching staff at Port Arthur Memorial raves about this kid's playmaking ability. They think he is going to be a high-impact Power 5 player. The A&M staff garnered quick favor with him once they arrived in College Station, so much so to the point where, like, we were, hey, do we need to get stuff ready for this kid mm-hmm. to commit? Now, he's kind of since taken his foot off the gas and slowed things down. He's going to take some more visits. We'll be back at Texas A&M this spring for a practice and probably at the spring game. So, I think just – both sides feeling each other out right now, but definitely a kid I can see in the class at some point. We had a gentleman yesterday here, uh, Gage Wilson, who goes to Belleville. Um, we, I think Obi asked him about DJ Sanders. Talk to us about him. <laughs> I, just, I, I think you've seen some of the video. Yeah. Like How many 300-pounders do you see move like that? Right. He's special, and he's got no idea. He's just now getting to the point where he's kind of harnessing his power and athleticism, but – it is like the perfect mold for like big time game changing interior defensive lineman. Six foot four, three hundred pounds, and bouncy athleticism. The first time I ever saw this kid do anything was I went to watch him them play Lagrange when he was a sophomore, right. and he had just gotten offered by Baylor, and it, Baylor was the first offer, and so I'm watching him go through pregame warmups, and I'm watching him do like karaoke and high knees, and I'm like. This kid is moving like a 180-pounder, and he's 300 pounds. It is really kind of insane to watch him move. And he's got a couple of clips on his highlights where he chases down the ball across the field, uh, chases down the ball carrier, and then plucks the football away from the guy like he's an infant child. Right. And then outruns the, the other team to the end zone. And, like, when you watch him open up and run at 300 pounds, it's like he's just gliding. He, he's a pretty sensational prospect. I've been doing this 
a while now, nearly 10 years on this recruiting stuff. He has he has as high of a ceiling as any defensive tackle prospect I can remember. And that's talking about like Marvin Wilson, Ed Oliver, uh, Keandre Coburn, Tavondre Sweat, like some of these guys that have been really impactful players, uh, whether they be at A&M or, or other places that I've saw, seen in greater Houston. I'm struggling to think of one with a higher ceiling than DJ Sanders. It, he's pretty gifted. I assume we'll hit some other positions here in the upcoming weeks. Well, that, you know, we kind of alternate our recruiting articles. Yep. Uh, and so whatever Jason wants to write about next week, which I'm glad he's he's got the the draw next week because I'll be on so much baseball stuff. Yep. Ronnie, thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate you. That's Recruiting Country brought to you by Cap Rock Health System. When we come back, we will turn the page to a little baseball talk. I believe Kendall Rogers will be joining us. Right now, a moment for Caldwell Country Chevrolet Highway 21 in Caldwell online, caldwellcountrychevrolet.com. It's the place to go, uh, the website, or in person when you're ready for a vehicle. If you're not just ready yet, but you know that day's coming, you know, just kind of do some window shopping by going to the website and see what they have there. Just take a look. Just just wet the appetite, see the vehicles, the Tahoes that they have, and just get a kind of feel for what they have there at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. The, the website has a lot of great deals. And then when you go in person, you'll be blown away by several different things. The customer service experience, the pricing, the people, the whole experience is top notch. There's a reason Dante Hall, RC Slocum, myself, Billy, we all buy our cars there from Caldwell Country Chevrolet because they take care of us, right? That's what they do at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. Uh, they've got uh, complimentary pickup for all the service customers. They've got just incredible people who work back there. You're going to love the entire process. You're going to get a great trade in value for your vehicle and a great price on your next car as well. 15 minute drive. We're talking the very edge of Brian to the beginnings of Caldwell. Short conversation away, but you'll see the difference when you step on the lot and do business with the great people there at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. Highway 21 in Caldwell online, caldwellcountrychevrolet.com.
All right, we're back here on Texas Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jules Rollo Insurance Studio. Time for a little D1 baseball talk with Kendall Rogers. We go to the Brian Foley Law Hotline. Kendall, what's up, buddy? Man, how's it going, bud? I'm how good. Are you? I'm good, man. Hey, so uh, how busy do you start getting right now? Uh, it's, a, it's a little crazy. Uh, you know, the, the, the radio requests roll in. You know, you have the people who you, know, you don't hear from for like 10 months who hey, you want to hop on in 10 minutes? And, and so, you know, it's, it's busy, but, but I love it, man. It's, it's, you know, thankfully the weather's been uh, fantastic. It looks like it's going to be great. Well, other than like one day this weekend down here, it's going to be pretty good weather and uh, very excited to see kind of just what happens. I think, you know, college baseball this year outside of the maybe, you know, Wake Forest, uh, I think it's pretty wide open. So it should be a lot of fun. So coming into a season, is this the most optimistic people have been for a Jim Schlossnagel A&M team? What would you say last year? Uh, I would say probably, I mean, last year I think I think false expectations were set a little bit. And I would say just, you know, not realistic expectations. You know, to, to get to the Final Four of the College of Baseball and to kind of expect the same exact thing the next year, uh, the tall order. Um, I, I do think when you look at this team overall, uh, I, I feel like this team has a chance to be better than the team that finished the Final Four in Omaha. And the reason why I think that is, I think, uh, I think uh, you know, Max will kind of fix things, fix things a little bit on the pitching staff. You know, I think guys like Link and I take a big step forward. I really like Tanner Jones in the fall. But where I really like this team uh, is just the overall balance and talent uh, from an offensive standpoint. You know, that team a couple of years ago was good offensively. But in terms of sheer talent, I, I think this lineup's better. Um, when you look at, you know, Lavalette, Brady Montgomery, uh, you know, you, you know, you look at, you know, Grahovic in the middle. I mean, that's going to be as good of, I, I don't know what order Schloss will have those guys in, but that's going to be as good of a trio in a lineup, uh, maybe the best in college baseball. Talking to Kendall Rogers here on the Brian Foley Law Hotline is Texas Radio. So let's kind of go through that um, and, and maybe mm-hmm. – uh, piece by piece. What do you think? What are some of the, the top reasons they could be scary, scary good this year? And then we'll kind of go through what could hold them back. Yeah, you know, I think the biggest thing when I look at A&M is I, I feel very good about the team offensively. Like, uh, you know, I, I don't look at this offense and go, like, there's, it, there's any question marks. I mean, it, you know, the thing is, if you know, I mentioned those three guys, I think uh, Ron Targach is, is a kid that's going to uh, is gonna bounce back this year. You know, a lot of people don't realize uh, outside of A and M, you know, he dealt with that was the foot injury last year uh, that really set him back. You know, Ted Burton, nobody, you know, nobody's really talked about that transfer. But uh, you're talking about a guy who's had a ton of at bats uh, in his collegiate career. You know, had a you know really solid season at Michigan last year. You know, getting him in the mix and Hayden Shot, another senior, getting him in that, uh, you know, getting him in that starting lineup. So what I really like about this team offensively is you've got those big power guys, but you also have you know, some versatility, you've got a lot of experience, you know, you've got three seniors at some key spots, so I really like that, and I also think when you look at the pitching staff as a whole, you know, I think the guys that I'm kind of most excited to see, frankly, uh, are Chris Cortez and Ryan Prager, you know, Prager, you know, had such a great freshman year, and obviously disappointing they had to miss last year to an injury, but it sounds like, you know, he's going to be in a really good spot, I'm excited to see him, and then, uh, you know, Cortez, I, I really feel like Chris Cortez is like the X factor for this team to potentially win a national championship. I think if Chris Cortez can take a big step forward, which he was much better in the fall, much better command, but we'll see if he can do it in the spring. But if he is much better and he pitches to his abilities, uh, I mean, this, not, not only is this team good, I think it's scary good because I think if he if he has a good year, I have no doubt Gallup Lampkin's going to have a good year. So that would give you, what, two or three uh, elite starting pitchers uh, you'd be in very, very good shape. Then, I mean, you look at the back end of the bullpen uh, with Ashton back and, and guys like that, and, you know, the bullpen's in good shape. So I, I'm pretty bullish on this team, I'll be honest with you. All right, but what could set them back? What could be a reason for them not reaching some of these uh, lofty goals? Absolutely. Uh, I, I think it starts with the mound. Um, I, I think, let's say Cortez resorts to the mean of the last two years. Let's say Tanner Jones great arm, but he makes a, you know, rocky transition to big time SEC baseball. And let's just say Justin Lincoln is just okay. Well, if, if Jones and Cortez, which those are the two guys you have the most uncertainty about because yeah, Jones may have really good stuff, but we haven't really proven at this level. If Cortez and Jones 
uh, unless say Prager makes a slow return back from injury, then all of a sudden the complexion of this team is much different. You're, you're, you know, you're having to throw, you know, Isaac Morton, who I, I think is going to be a stud in the future, but you're throwing a guy like Isaac Morton straight out of high school, uh, right into your weekend rotation, and then, and then the complexion of this pitching staff starts to take on a different, a different look. And so, I, I just think to me it all hinges on the pitching staff. You know, not to throw too much pressure on you know Max Weiner, but I mean that that to me is literally the only question mark of this team. Do you think Ali Camarillo is going to be, or Camarillo, however we want to phrase it here, uh, do you think he's going to be a household name? Uh, first of all, I like your way better. Okay. Uh, it sounds way, way more official. Uh, number two, uh, I, I do. Um, I think he's a really solid, uh, you know, hitter. I, you know, I, I don't think he's going to be a guy that's going to hit 350 with nine jacks. Like, that's not what I'm expecting out of him. But I think he can be a, a 280, 300 hitter, you know, give you six, seven pops. Uh, at the plate, and then also just defensively, I, I'm a big fan. Uh, I had not seen him before, you know, uh, from at Northridge last year. Uh, and you know, when I saw him in the fall, uh, he's actually way better than I was expecting. Like I, I thought he was very instinctual uh, at, at shortstop. Uh, I thought he had a strong arm and an accurate arm. He, he checked all three boxes, and you know, I actually, you know, I, you know, I think if you look at some of the A and M shortstops over the last few years. He's, he might be the most kind of well-rounded. You know, Hunter Haas I thought was pretty well-rounded. I mean, he hit for a pretty good average. But, you know, I think Camarillo, to me, has a little bit more upside than all of those guys. How about pitching? Back to pitching for a minute. How about just the fact that some of these guys will be back another year, right? Like, last year was not good. We know that. But just a little bit more season, a little bit more time. How much of that can play a role in the way we look at this entire staff? It can play a huge role because I think, it, you know, it, innings pitch always matters, right? You know, appearances, uh, playing in big situations. You know, Evan Ashenbach is a great example. Like, he's a guy that, you know, last year had to pitch in so many big situations, sometimes in, a, in uncomfortable situations because they didn't have another option, and he excelled. So, you know, you get a guy like that back who's been through the, the, the biggest battles of the battles in the SEC, uh, even a guy like Cortez. Uh, you know, when you're when you're getting beat around a little bit and you come back, you know, it kind of gives you a different perspective. It, I, I think it creates a little bit more uh, focus to some degree. And so I think it's a huge factor. And, and that's, a, you know, it kind of goes back to the offense. That's why I like the fact they've got, you know, three or four seniors in that, in that lineup. I think that really matters in college baseball, probably more so than some other sports. Talking to Kendall Rogers here on Texags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers here in the Rollo Insurance Studio. The early returns on Prager, you alluded to it a moment ago, though, but pretty good so far? Yeah, it seems like it. I mean, everything I heard in the fall or late in the fall about his progression was very positive. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll be very honest, I haven't asked him about it since uh, the holiday break, but it sounded like they were pretty bullish about his ability to come back and be pretty effective this year. So, you know, let, let's just assume for a second that he's good to go. You know, you're talking about Lampkin, Jones, Cortez, Prager, Ashenbeck, Ozzie Morton. I remember Ozzie Morton. I think he's going to be very good. I think he's up to 96, 97 the day I saw the Ags at U of H. Really good off-speed stuff. I, I can actually see him being in the rotation if he makes a quick transition. I think Schloss is playing it safe right now, you know, listing him as a reliever. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think he's going to be really good. And in the, in the Charleston State kid, uh, Zane Bedmaid, um, they the, the coaching staff loves him. Uh, you know, and I went and looked at the synergy video and it was 93, 94, but it's a Husky build with a, a white box slider. And uh, they have really high hopes for him. I think they had him listed as a closer uh, in our preseason survey. I don't know if that'll stick, but I mean, I, I like him. And then of course the, the, the Peyton Smith kid, the transfer out of DD has a big arm. And I know, you know, he's, he was down the list, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, you know, versus some other guys, but again, another big arm, I, the, the overall talent, on this team is the best by far that Jim has had at A&M. Gavin Grohovic, I, the way people talk about him is very similar to the way people talked about Jace uh, Lavalette last year coming into the season. Jace struggled a little bit in the beginning, and then when he got the SEC play, he took it to another level. Uh, I don't know if those are uh, you know fair comparisons because they're different types of players, but like what what do you think? I mean, can Grohovic have a kind of impact that maybe we saw a little bit from last year from Jace? I think he can have more of an impact. Wow. Um, I'll say this about Lavalette. As much as I liked him in the fall last year, um, there were at bats where you kind of like, okay, like he's you know he's got some work to do. Like you know he missed you know he missed that pitch by uh, you know decent a, a decent amount. And 
Uh, you know, granted, let's be honest. I mean, it was a, it was a one night look at Grohovic, but when I saw Grohovic at U of H, it really kind of took me back to the first time I saw Dylan Cruz at LSU, uh, his first ball uh, scrimmage. When I saw Cruz, it was like one of those things where you know it's like you know looking at a six two you know two hundred pound running back that's four three speed and breaks every tackle. You see the guy do one run, and you're like, okay, I'm sold. And I was that way with Dylan Cruz the first time I saw him, and that's exactly the way I felt watching Grahovic for the first time uh, against U of H. I mean, he he's got a great build. He reminds me so much of Josh Young physically when he was at Texas Tech. Same kind of you know same kind of build. He's athletic. He can play multiple positions. He's got a great offensive approach. Uh, he hits with a with a ton of power. I mean, every single box with that dude is checked. And he, you can have a situation, and, and you know, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but you could legitimately have a situation where A&M can, could have the top prospect in the 25 draft and the 26 draft with, with Grohovic. It would not shock me that much. Hey, let's close with this. You mentioned it's wide open outside of maybe Wake Forest. What makes Wake Forest such a, a deadly team this year? Yeah, it, it all starts on the mound. I mean, Corey Mascara, the, the reigning assistant and coach of the year, I mean, he did a phenomenal job of the pitching staff last year. And uh, I tell you what, they are loaded again this year. I mean, Josh Hartle, the first team All-Americans back for another year. Uh, you know, Michael Massey, who's up to 98-99, you know, as a starter last year, he ended up, you know, he ended up having to be their, their like, midweek guy at times last year because they were so loaded. Uh, he moved in the rotation. Uh, and then they added Chase Burns from Tennessee. You guys, the Aggies, are well aware of Chase Burns in Tennessee. Uh, I, I want to say Burns in his last two inter-squad scrimmages, which, by the way, Wade's going to have a solid offensive team, but in his last two uh, scrimmages in the spring, uh, I want to say he struck out like 24 in 12 innings. Um, that's pretty good. So it seems like Chase Burns has kind of figured it out. You know, he had that great freshman here, took a step back, and it looks like he's ready to roll. So to me, it's just the, the sheer amount of pitching – to go with it, it won't be as explosive an offense as the way had last year, but with Nick Hurts and those guys, they're still gonna be pretty productive. Kendall Rogers, D1 baseball, there on the Brian Foley Law Hotline. Kendall, appreciate you, brother. You got it, man. Have a good one. Thank you very much. All right, we're gonna hit a break right, here we when we come back on Texax Radio. Eric Asaris is going into his heart. A year ago, roughly today, I think it was today, right? Yep, exactly a year ago today. He told people who he was in love with. He's going to do that again next here. He's going to profess his love for people here on the show. That and more. It's Texax Radio.
Time to end the day with Double Days. Caller number 12, 979-693-1150. We'll hook you up with your choice of a dozen pepperoni rolls or a large one-topping pizza from Double Dave's. They've been serving Aggieland since 1984 with your favorite pizza and world-famous pepperoni rolls. Reliable in-house delivery, bringing piping hot goodness straight to your door. Just click on DoubleDave's.com and your favorites are on their way. Let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Eric Casares, who are you in love with, buddy? I'm in love with five specific people right now. If you don't know the criteria, I did this last year, like David was mentioning, giving love to all the people in the sports world right now. Happy Valentine's Day to all the couples out there. I don't have any love to give to a specific girl right now, but I do have love to give to a lot of specific people, five of them. And just want just a little disclaimer there. This is not in any particular order. Okay? Sure. So it doesn't matter where you're ranked. You're just in the top five. You're giving some love from your boy this morning. So let's go ahead and start with one and two. I added two people on here from the same sport. Track and field, Lamar Disson and J.Q. Scott earned SEC honors, popping off at the Tiger Paul Invitational in Clemson. Fortunately, I wasn't there to witness it myself. I was in Boston, but great, great outing for those two. Lamar, SEC Women's Field Athlete of the Week. That's her second this season. And then, of course, J.Q., SEC Men Co-Runner of the Week. That's his first of his career, so... Uh, cl- cleared seven six in the hurdles, and then Lamar six and five and a half nation leading mark also on the Bowerman watch list. They popped off there. Oh yeah, very good. And by the way, I think you are ranking them in the order. You are from the endurance sports world, uh, <laughs> and it just so happened that one and two came from track and field. Come on. Well, you know, you know how much I like football. So this next one is coming up. You could argue that too. Number three, I got Steve Spagnola, Kansas City Chiefs defensive coordinator. Not only has he turned around this KC defense this year, yeah. this has probably been the best in the Mahomes era. But I mean, the fact that he shut down Christian McCaffrey, forced a fumble, held the 49ers run game to three and a half yards per carry. I mean, Chris Jones made the two biggest plays in overtime to, you know, give them the ball back and give a chance for Mahomes to go down the field. Everyone's going to be talking about Mahomes you know, greatness, which obviously shouldn't be overshadowed. But I think, uh, you know, you're looking at the underrated part of the game. Uh, you got to look at Steve Spagnuolo. So he comes in at number three. Spags. How many Super Bowls does he have now? That's three his fourth one. Is his yeah. fourth? Oh, wow. Three with the Chiefs, one with the Giants back in 07. Yep. Uh, number four, Joni Taylor. Can't forget about Miss Taylor up there. SEC uh, women's basketball coach for Texas A&M. She also got awarded to compete in the 2024 Olympic <sighs> Games in Paris. Um, and be the assistant coach for the 2024 USA Women's Basketball National Team. So congrats to Joni Taylor there. And then number five, he was on the show earlier, loved what he had to say. Great Billy guy. Lucci. Mike Elko, actually. Oh, oh, yeah, right. but I love Billy also. Uh, joining us in the studio today, returning to Aggie Land and looking to build a future for Aggie football. That's all the love I got for y'all today. It's a lot of love right there. You're just full of love. You going to do anything special for Valentine's for your loves, Eric? Nope, I'm going to go run 10 miles today. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, I think I'll pass. <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for Tech Sags Radio here on a Wednesday. Uh, th- not Thanksgiving, goodness gracious. A Valentine's version of the program. As Eric said, we had uh, Mike Elko for half an hour. That was phenomenal, followed by Billy and OB doing that little uh, hour with us. We kind of pushed back the go hour. Tom Schubert giving us, oh, that's right, we had to talk about basketball. Basketball was not fun yesterday. Ah, we talked with Bronny, recruiting, got us ready for the, uh, the, the front line there, offensive line and defensive line, and, of course, Kendall Rogers. That's going to do it for the program. Uh, tomorrow on the show, I know we have Logan Lee. I know we have some other stuff planned. Um, don't know exactly what. Just Jim Schlossnagel oh, on the show? That's right. It's Thursday. We got Schloss again. I got Richard Zane, too. Goodness gracious, this is going to be great. That's going to do it for the program. We'll see you mañana.